<laughs> well, I, I, I look at it like I, I'm, I'm always trolling people about composition. You know, I say there's no such thing as a good composition. Oh, yeah? And yeah, and I, and that's obviously a troll to engage people. Sure. Because I do think that there probably is good composition, but I see these rule books and these rules of composition mm-hmm. and usually set out by guys about my age who think that they have distilled truth and beauty down to Pythagorean theorem or some other, you know, drawing circles on master paintings or something. <laughs> and the thing is, is, you know, every, every, I can find masterworks that break every single one of those rules. Yeah. Well, and the, yeah. I, I can still, but if that doesn't mean that these rules are ineffectual, it means they are incomplete. And it doesn't mean that there is not some way that you can make perfect compositions, just we haven't understood it yet. These are like incomplete glimpses. They are shadows on the cave wall of what really is platonic truth out there, of what good composition is. Mm-hmm. But we're so far away from understanding that. And I think that uh, you know, quantifying it and understanding physiology uh, the way our brain works, we're, you know, we will get to a better idea of how all that interacts. There is an answer to it. Mm. It's just that we're just kind of worms rolling around in the mud at this point. <laughs> even, even how our own brain works. Okay. Well, we were talking while we were getting everything set up. We were talking a bit about Hawaii. You live in Maui. I used to live there as well. And I, I went to Lahaina Luna school in Lahaina and Lahaina is now gone. The front street mm-hmm. area is gone. Uh, yeah. I mean, I don't think people are expecting us to talk about this right at the bat, but I didn't realize that you were still in Hawaii. I thought you had moved and, but I guess, um, you're back, which is, I guess you can't leave the islands, you know? So <laughs> No, it, it it's home. Yeah, I mean, we left for a variety of reasons. Um and it, it, you know, one, you know, I, I guess it's probably relevant to what one of the topics we'll talk to is is uh we couldn't afford to live here anymore. Mm. Um uh, but uh no, it, it 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 is home. I've wanted to live here ever since I was very young. It was always, I, I feel like I was, I mean, I'm not a real mystical kind of person, but there's just something that told me this is where I should be for whatever reason. And so it, it just feels right to be here and it doesn't feel right to be elsewhere. I can't really quantify it any other way than that. Hmm. That's Hawaii for you. That's exactly it. it it's it's a place that calls you and you know it yeah it's either it's either speaks to you or it doesn't i i believe it's the the aina it's the land it's the nature it's the vibrancy of it um it's got a lot of weird people there but <laughs> every place has a lot of weird people but hawaii in particular has this unique breed of humans that live there that coexist there yeah <laughs> Yeah. yeah, that's that's one of the cool things about it is yeah. the the mixing of different people and cultures, and they all seem to get along pretty well. Somewhat, not always. Yeah, <laughs> but you know, be- better than other places. Yeah, I guess it's like anything, and this is something we'll dive into is perception of it all. So it's like you know, you have the locals who are very sovereign to the land and their culture, and then you have the tourists that come in who are not even aware of it, which is really interesting. So there's a friction point there. Right. And, and then, then there's the Hawaiians who are a completely separate entity. Yes. Yeah. The true Hawaiians, like the ones that are really sovereign to their culture and stuff, that's a whole nother level. Yeah. yeah. They're yeah. very different than the locals. Yeah. And then you have the Haoles who adapt to this. Or the Haoles. So if you're listening, you're not sure what Haole means. It's like a, I guess you could say it's somewhat of a derogatory term or use of words for white people. <laughs> it, 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 it depends on context yes it's all I mean, technically context. you know it, it just means stranger but yeah you know. or a ghost or something i can't remember yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's been a while huh? <laughs> but yeah well when i was so uh, a little backstory i grew up my mom loved hawaii 
uh, it took me a little bit to love Hawaii because at the time I was very young. I had long blonde hair and it was like, I was stood out like a, like a sore thumb, basically. <laughs> it was, right, so right. I was, I was the brunt of many jokes and many fights and many arguments because every school was very tribalist kind of like, and that's how it is everywhere, I think, because I traveled a lot. Yeah. But anyways, uh, as I grew up, I, I eventually grew to like understand and love the islands and, and the nature of it all. And, um, the chaos of it and the humbling nature of it and stuff too. So the last place I lived was Lahaina. That's when I moved. I moved from Lahaina back to the mainland. The concrete jungle is what the Hawaiians, <laughs> the locals call the the mainland, basically, which is also what we call America. <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> but I, I I do miss it. And and my wife and my daughter and I we go back and visit every once in a while. Um, and I get a weird feeling when I'm there. Like I almost become a teenager again mentally <laughs> so yeah, yeah yeah i'm sure yeah but i can't believe lahaina's is now gone it, it it uh it was quite an emotional thing for me because front street was a very special place um yeah and it, to see the devastation it was like wow it always was in somewhat of a drought but yeah just to to know that the fires basically wiped it out it's crazy how is it going over there like with the island the, how are people dealing with it uh well, there's almost nobody that doesn't know somebody who either lost their home or died. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of people are now telling their stories in long form, and it's pretty horrific. Um, but I, I kind of, a silver lining to me is that, you know, how traumatic something like this is to us and how we've reacted to it uh, kind of shows just, how much control we have achieved over our environment that something like this is shocking because through most of history this happened all the time mm -hmm. and you know oh half our population is gone through dysentery or something we don't even understand all oh, that's just life mm -hmm. but you know now there's almost seems to be kind of an expectation that well why aren't the utilities buried or, you know why haven't we managed this better um so which are all completely le legitimate questions and i think going forward they will be addressed mm. and so hopefully it's going to decrease the incidence of things like this that's a good way of looking at it yeah i mean it is true throughout our evolution on this planet we have been completely side <laughs> like nature basically humbles us at every turn and, well, uh, I mean, I think the fact that all humans can interbreed shows that there was a keyhole, which at one point we were almost gone. Yeah. Yeah, perspective is crazy, uh, especially if you look at it like that, and it's humbling. And yeah, it's uh, the land and, and nature and all of these things is just uh, to expect that these things will be continual and ever present and always there is almost like a it's almost like not even looking at it correctly, you know? <laughs> it's like, no, you're not looking at this this reality truly, which is interesting. Yeah, yeah. 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 I but, think there is kind of an anthropomorphic, I, don't know, I can't say that word, uh, of, of, you know, like a, a transactional uh, relationship with nature that if we treat the Aina with respect, then it will treat us with respect. And mm. I don't think it has anything to do with that because people want to see moral narrative in everything. <laughs> and it just isn't. No, uh, extinction is the most natural thing in the world. Mm. And, you know, that's kind of the, I mean, it's not, it's not that we're at war with nature. It's just mm. that we have to understand it and realize that the forces of entropy are going to get us in the end if we don't pay careful attention. Mm. Yeah, it's not on our terms and us understanding that it's not our rule book to set the rules. It's literally just the existence of life. And that's yep. the beauty of nature and looking at it. There's a book that I was reading called The Denial of Death. Have you read it that? Have you ever read that book? No. It's very interesting, very thought provoking, very hard to listen and read to, <laughs> read to as well. Because it's, you know, when a book uh, speaks to you with truth, um, mm -hmm. but, but the truth isn't what you want to hear. This is one of those, it's one of those, yeah. <laughs> which is often the truth you should hear, which is the one that's the hardest one to deal with. So, but yes. um, it kind of goes into our entire psyche as, as a species is, is based around our denial of death um, and how that yeah. is actually a cause of um, an enormous 
uh, misunderstanding of life itself <laughs> so yeah maybe so yeah yeah you think like if if you really if, if somebody if a, a magical fairy were to come to you tomorrow and say you're going to live forever how would that change what you do and then by extension does that mean that the the, the news of our eventual death motivates and controls our every action every day mm. that's kind of dark yeah yeah but it might be true well, the truth and the fact is we know that we will pass. So this is the thing. <laughs> so yeah. acknowledging it, it, like dismissing it is the problem. I think that's what the the, the core of the book is, but I've not yeah. finished it. So I haven't, I can't uh-huh. talk about the total <laughs> summation of it. But yeah, it's, it's a, uh, yeah, I don't know. Like if we were able to have eternal morality, like being able to live, I mean, what would be, I guess, that would just be a whole another can of worms i suppose you know so it would change everything completely you know i i was like okay i'm gonna live forever oh that's great i'm gonna spend the next ten thousand years learning uh the complete history of roman numerals because i've got the time <laughs> yeah true yeah and <laughs> but you know i i do kind of wonder maybe maybe it's not my kids but maybe their kids they they might be immortal yeah there there's talk of uh um singularity coming uh we'll miss it unfortunately i think <laughs> yeah. but our kids yeah. kids they might it's i think really the you know if we get into it i think it's really the the matter of of what a memory is and how to basically manufacture a memory and then then transcending past the body form and then becoming energy basically that's really what it has to be <laughs> in order to to truly have singularity because the thing that is our biggest hindrance is our body because that's the thing that we have no control over and it just simply perishes. So <laughs> um, yeah, I, yeah, just on a more, you know, meat level, I think you're going to be able to repair your body. You know, you you'll be you know, if if you are at a certain strata of society and can afford it at least at first, yeah, you're going to be able to keep spare parts about and 3D print the rest. Yeah, that's going to be interesting. Um that's definitely we we'll, we're going to see I think uh I was reading a uh, an article that was stating that amongst us now is a 200 year old human being. Yeah. Yeah. That's kind of where I'm thinking. My, my kids are going to live to be well over a hundred probably. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. Hopefully that, that they enjoy those hundred years well over a hundred. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, the thing is, is the whole mechanism of natural selection, which is hugely inefficient and cruel is going to be gone away, but I'm not sure if we have, the wisdom and understanding to replace its function adequately. Mm. No, I, I highly doubt that. <laughs> I, <laughs> I highly doubt I, that. I, yeah. You're probably and, right. Yeah. Well, you know, it's like, uh, it's like every fable or every kind of Aesop kind of quail of, of thought. Basically it's like we're constantly uh, in this ebb and flow of, of grasping knowledge and then letting it go. And, and I think, um, I'm really excited and ter- terrified of what AI is going to do for us, but I'm really excited for it in many ways because I think it's going to help give us the perspective that we intrinsically lack as a species and as humans um, because I feel like we just don't have the clarity of, of foresight to the future. You know, it's like we're just now like, hey, there's global warming and you know, like taking these things seriously, but then we're all, let's yeah. use electric cars, but nobody understands that electric vehicles are just as harmful in many different ways at scale yeah. so it's like it's just scale problems and all these kind of intrinsic issues that happen so i don't know if everybody lasting past what we're, our deadline is going to help the earth and our goals but maybe it will i don't know maybe i mean how old are you now craig i'm 59 almost 60 damn okay 60 so i'm 40 i'm 20 i'm 19 years behind you but at 60 your perspective on life has got to be vastly different than when you were 20 correct yeah. So absolutely. perhaps the older the age, the better the perspective, and the better the perspective for the people that are around. Maybe the be- the world gets better from that. Who knows? I don't know. It's an interesting uh, thing I, to think about. <laughs> I I'm I'm constantly battling people my age who are you know turning into grumpy old men. Mm. What's your and, advice to them? Uh, read more history. <laughs> That's a good because- one. I mean, they, they they tend to have this nostalgia, and they invent a past that never existed. Mm, yeah, and and they and they you know bemoan the fact that 
you know, and <laughs> every time somebody gets older, they, you know, they fall into that trap and, 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 and seeing other people doing it, doesn't that logically tell you that it is in fact an illusion, <laughs> but <laughs> they don't see that. No, kids are, they? they're all shitheads now. <laughs> and yeah. I, I just, I absolutely, you know, I'm so optimistic for the future of yes. humanity. I'm, I'm not for, you know, Individually, we're all screwed, but you know, the collective <laughs> enterprise. No, we're we're in better shape than we've ever been. Oh yeah, and we live better can, than the kings of the past. Yeah. Well, and and just our control over our environment, and yeah. it's just so much better. And if anybody doubts that, I have to say the same thing to the grumpy old men. Learn about history. Learn where we've come from. Yeah. And learn what reality was like. Yeah, it's humbling. I love history for that exact reason because it puts yeah. me right in my place where I need to be because you can often look at life with these rose-colored lenses and look to the past with your objective view of it, which is often skewed towards what you're interested in. And so when right. you see, let's say, use the analogy of all these kids are shitty, well, you're looking at it as if the kids weren't in the past, but kids have always <laughs> have have always been shitty <laughs> and they've always been that's great their job. Yeah, that's their job. It is. Their job is to be yeah. extremely selfish and self-absorbed and focused on what their task is. That's how they survive basically. Yeah. <laughs> and if, you know, and I, I have you know, students that if they do things that I don't understand, that's exactly how it should be. Mm. As opposed to, no, I, in my 60 years, I boiled everything down to these few, few simple rules because I'm getting mentally uh, lazy and <laughs> it's all reductionist and you don't follow these rules, you're screwed. Mm. So, you know, I, I remember like teachers art centers saying, no, you have to learn how to draw. And, you know, I'm, that's about the, one of the most basic things in illustration, but now I'm really not so sure. It's kind of an interesting <laughs> issue. I'm, I'm willing to give up on that ironclad rule depending yeah. on, you know, how, how things go. What do you think um, students must do? Do you, have you distilled it down to something? Because if, if you're already no, questioning I, that I, idea. I, I, no, I, I, I don't think that I am qualified to know that I have not reached a, a, a level in which I understand. I mean, I've tried to push the, the rock forward a millimeter. Uh, it's not like I have broken through and now I see truth and light. No, I don't. So, uh, you know, it, it's just, um, that really is a test for me is if I don't understand what they're doing, they're probably doing it right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's beautiful. And I personally align with that truth that you've discovered. Cause if you told me there was an answer to that question, you would have to be full of shit, <laughs> you know, cause there's yep. no, there's no answer to this. Well, okay. Maybe there is right. Maybe the answer is, there is may, may, maybe own. out there 10,000 years in the, in the future, but at this point, no. Yes. Yeah. Well, maybe, but it's all, again, a lot of what we discuss and sometimes it makes me wonder why I even have these conversations because it can be so nebulous because it's all perspective and subjective. And then it's like, yeah. okay, well, well then what are we doing? But it's, it's fun to entertain the time and to meet and discuss. <laughs> well, I, I, I look at it like I, I'm, I'm always trolling people about composition. You know, I say there's no such thing as a good composition. Oh yeah. And yeah. And I, and that's obviously a troll to engage people. Sure. Because I do think that there probably is good composition, but I see these rule books and these rules of composition mm -hmm. and usually set out by, guys about my age who think that they have distilled truth and beauty down to Pythagorean theorem or some other, you know, drawing circles on master paintings or something. <laughs> and the thing is, is, you know, every, every, I can find masterworks that break every single one of those rules. Yeah. Well, and the, I, I can still, but if that doesn't mean that these rules are ineffectual, it means they are incomplete. And it doesn't mean that there is not some way that you can make perfect compositions, just we haven't understood it yet. These are like incomplete glimpses. They are shadows on the cave wall of what really is platonic truth out there, what good composition is. Mm -hmm. But we're so far away from understanding that. And I think that uh, you know, quantifying it and understanding physiology 
uh, the way our brain works, we're, you know, we will get to a better idea of how all that interacts. There is an answer to it. Mm. It's just that we're just kind of worms rolling around in the mud at this point, <laughs> even, even how our own brain works mm. and like, you know, like what, what they're doing with, with self-driving cars and understanding how the, the, the eye and brain works to take little bits of light and, and generate a three-dimensional space. It's truly incredible. You know, the, the, the complexity and the processing that goes on there. And it's the same thing with art, understanding how we see, how that ties into uh, our, our character, our upbringing, our, our, our nature, and, and how it ba bounces off all this kind of different stuff. All that feeds back into what is good composition. And then people want to reduce it to, well, if you put the horizon through the middle of the painting, that's bad. And it's like, <laughs> oh, Jesus, how limiting is that? And then, you know, you see 20-year-old kids, you know, in, in, in a place where there's authority. Uh, you know, writing this down, like, oh, don't put the, 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 this horizon through the middle of the picture. Oh. <laughs> and it, it's so sad to see that being put on them. Yeah, it that is. Now, now they have that in, in the bouncing around inside their brain. That's why I say, you know, I want you to break all these rules because the rules that we have are so incomplete and so primitive. Yes. Oh man, so much to unpack there. I've been taking notes as you're going. This is wonderful. And I love, and I appreciate that you're going into this area because it's definitely something to be discussed. Rules of composition, for example, and then people being authoritarians on the idea that there's rules to these things when in fact there isn't. There's personal truths. I can concede yeah. and agree to that. One artist's quests and their personal truths are completely within reason of logic and I completely can, that's cool. That's great that yeah. you've discovered that this is what's pleasant to you in your neurological assessment of image making, you know, right. <laughs> if we distill. And then you have to, work, you have to work backward from that to yes. distill possibly larger truths. But uh, yeah, it's not to say that there are not those rules. It's just that we do not understand them. Cause I know then that, that's why kind of like people make art that I don't understand, but it's wildly popular with other people. Yeah. And that, operationally defined is wonderful yeah and then you have to work backwards and figure out how and why it works yeah. and to that you know we can take that knowledge and add it to our greater understanding of exactly what's going on hmm. yeah it's it's well that's if you're willing to take the journey of self-exploration and as you mentioned that your age is 69 being able to have that breadth of visibility is really awesome it's great to have because I, the way I look at it, and I'm, so I'm just an assume that you have the same inc uh, quest on life, which is we're all students to it. There is no such thing as a master of art. Would you agree? Uh, I would say there is a, there is mastery of uh, a primitive set of principles. Mm, okay. Let's ex can you elaborate on that? Because that's also interesting to talk about, to, to compartmentalize the principles aspect of it from the subjective, non-subjective aspect of what art can be in the form of mastery. Yeah, because I, yeah, I, I, I am not a mystic. And you know, a lot of the things I might say might lead people to say, oh, he's talking about spirituality and art or mysticism. And no, those are just like uh, kind of cheats to understand complexity or to deal with complexity. I mean, there, there is a mechanism there. There is a deterministic mechanism as to how our brain works, how art works, its appeal. And, you know, so right now we understand very little of that. And it's a lot of it is done intuitively, which I think leads to the illusion that it is spiritual or mystical. But people are explicating this stuff and, and quantifying it and demystifying it. And just the same way that people have done that with religions, a lot of artists are getting very upset about that, that uh, we're understanding more about how our brain works and how art works inside the brain. And, <laughs> and that is, it, it's deeply threatening. I, I understand that. Um, so yeah, like take, take for instance, um, you know, example I use is that, uh, that little red haired girl from frozen, uh, you know, they have the ice queen, the, 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 the blonde, and then the one with the red hair. And that, that girl with the red hair, I swear, if she told me to, to kill the president, I would. 
<laughs> okay, extrapolate. <laughs> okay, tell me what the hell you just said. Why you said? Because I I really think that they're probably data scientists that like crawled inside the human male mind and figured out exactly the proportions, like the width of the eyes, the scale of the eyes, the angle of the eyes, you know, all and the, and the shape of the skull to make the perfect female that will be able to manipulate and 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 any and, and be able to completely bypass my rational faculty to get me to buy crap. Mm -hmm. I mean that that is the ultimate goal here, isn't it? Is to make a character or some type of art. And as an illustrator, that's what we do. We're we're hired to to sell crap. And the more I can bypass your rational faculty and get you to get excited about a product and get your brainstem to hit that buy button, the more um successful i am so that's why i'm saying that you know th this is a science there is a pony in there there is a mechanism it is not spiritual it is not mystical and we're slowly figuring out for better or for worse yeah and i think it's i think it's alarming for most people that that were fueled by the concept of the nebulous nature of i um, feel the muse or this abstraction um it's kind of it's like the mind that believes in the boogeyman in the closet. And once you realize there isn't and you start to go, oh, it's just like my neurons. And then you start to identify like, oh, I'm having a, a, a dump of a certain hormone that's happening here. And all these things are right. just a facsimile. And then it, it demystifies yeah. it, basically. Uh, yeah, a lot of people think that diminishes us as human beings. And I don't, I, think so. I don't see. No. I, I don't think so either. No, it's, I think it's facing the facts, which... Uh, when you face the facts then you can remove that that abstraction and then you mm -hmm. can even see it for what it really beautifully is which is almost like a a formula of math or something beautiful like as this uh yeah it's yeah like it's even it's far even more, more beautiful, beautiful than, than than the mystical nonsense that we've all grown up with yeah i think when you put that label on something you i you you misinterpret how beautiful it truly is but then when you see it for what it is then you really go oh my goodness like this is <laughs> this is levels beyond my comprehension and i don't think right. if i will ever really truly see what it is which is humbling mm -hmm. and the truth at least for me the personal truth that as of now it's at age 40 dedicating a, a, an alarming amount of time in my life to just loving whatever this thing this word called art is these three letters together <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah it's it's fascinating yeah this couldn't agree more yeah and, you know i i look at art as like it's not a thing it it, it is a way of interpreting the world so it mm. it's like art goes out into math and science and and you know most advances in science are you know are from material science. That's why we have the Bronze Age or, you know, mm -hmm. information age. Well, not information age, but usually it was, you know, having had to do with materials. But it's it's like um understanding anatomy. What does that have to do with art or understanding art in and of itself? So to me, it's like art is the gateway to studying the world and a way of interpreting it and making sense of it and then expressing the results of my forays into these dives into why things are structured the way that they are and then filtering it in a way that is is interesting for the viewer and digestible even so you look at way el greco does his figures you know well that isn't how people look <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> but you know there's uh there's something really interesting about looking at it that way because you're exaggerating something that might be really important yeah there i was i had this interesting conversation with my friend caroline and she's really advanced with the, the understanding of art world beyond me in a lot of ways the history and stuff and she was saying that she was giving me a point of perspective and she said you know before and i i'm paraphrasing so i might mix things up but she said that before photography artists were recreating what they could to translate reality when the photography when photographs came into play and they started to really have an impact on how humans interacted with elements of reality via image making then mm -hmm. the whole shift happened where the artist said well uh, okay well that's done no we need to think differently and then 
you know, then we can just use a touchstone artist that everybody understands and identifies like a Picasso or something or a, uh, a Monet, a Monet, they, the impressionist age came about because it was like, well, a, f- a photograph can't capture my emotion to this thing, you know, <laughs> and then, so on and so forth. Mm-hmm. And, and so it, what it kind of comes down to is, I, and I'm rambling here, I, I had a point, I'm, I lost it, but what I'm trying to get to, I think, is that the, there's no, it's a moving target and it's mm-hmm. always on the move. And I, you said a way, you think of art as a way of interpreting the world. I think I've always thought of it as art is, and this is probably the same thing, art is a vessel to explore my curiosities of reality. You know, is, mm-hmm. do you still look at it like that? Do you, do you can feel connected to that in, at all? Yeah, absolutely. I, I might have a bit more materialistic view of it, like an engineer would, because mm. I'd rather hang around with engineers than artists personally <laughs> what? Yeah, just in general <laughs> why but that's just kind of but that's just kind of the, <laughs> I'm just kidding. But it, it 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 kind of fits into you know in general what i'm saying you know about trying to understand things better and the and the way that engineers look at it and scientists is, is they 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 pull it apart and try to understand it and artists are kind of very in general i mean this is such a broad brush yeah yeah i mean Please don't take um, offense to what we're saying. If you're, if you are, then you're misinterpreting. So yeah. <laughs> yeah so it, it, in general, I mean, I find a lot of artists and, and to be on the mystical side, like there's some, there, 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 there is a ghost in the machine in our head mm. and I create things out of spiritual. So th- there isn't kind of the, the you know, hard driving desire to understand to pull it apart, to isolate variables, to turn things on their head, to, you know, that's, that's a scientific and engineering approach. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of my, where I come from, but. Have you always been like you know, that? Yeah, I'll, mm-hmm. always. So I, like I objectively would, looking I at it like a technician or engineer. Yeah, trying to understand it the best way. And the, 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 that to me is the best tool to overcome my limitations in, in cognition. And, mm-hmm. and because I do, I mean, science to me is, is a method of inquiry that has been designed to get around um, some very serious limitations uh, of the human brain and how it looks at things, all kinds of biases and wanting to see patterns where there aren't patterns. Yeah, tons of biases, um, yeah. Tons of biases, and I'm just like, oh God, if I just lived in that soup, I'm trying to get out of that soup as much as I can to try to find some clarity to it. And like artists are like sitting there with their opium pipe, going, "Yeah, isn't it beautiful, dude?" <laughs> and and I just, it's just not me. I mean, I'm, I'm not saying they're wrong because they're again, it, you know, amazing things have have come out of that way of looking at it, and and even I have to go back to that way of operating when i am making art because if i do try to get out my protractor and make a beautiful composition based on my limited understanding it doesn't work yeah. but if i do it intuitively then it works yeah. and i do work very intuitively mm-hmm. you know do i like this does this speak to me and i know there is a way of quantifying that but i can't right now because i don't understand anything <laughs> but that doesn't mean I am not going to go back and try to figure out why it worked. <laughs> Interesting. I like that approach though. I think that's really, uh, yeah. And it's, what's great is that like, these are just conversations and your understanding of yourself and your art today will be t- changed tomorrow and you can have an yes. epiphany and a full switch on it, which is wonderful. And these are just opinions that are isolated at this date, which is August Monday, August 28th, 2023. Right. <laughs> Subject to uh-huh. change. <laughs> Subject to change, and hopefully it will. Yeah, exactly. That is really, I mean, what kind of life would we be if, if it was consistently the same thing? I think I, I personally yearn for consistency, but I know it's a trivial task. You know, it's like, the, it's just life is chaotic. It's the, 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 yeah. the, the, the sooner you get come to that term of understanding that, probably the better your life would be. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I, I think it, it is like, it, you know, different people have different tolerances for chaos. Mm, yeah. Some people love it. Some people don't. Yeah. yeah. But you, you do have to adjust to it because, you know, the amount of the, the rate of change is 
getting faster and faster. So I think the people that um, would prefer a more stable environment are going to have a tougher time. Yeah, there's no such thing but, as, with this stuff. But, you know, if they want, that's the kind of the cool thing about, uh, you know, the, the way the world is kind of balkanizing I mean, the art world has. You know, there is no French Academy saying this is the way. It's all fragmented. And I think the same thing could be for people in general. If you wish a stable environment, we can create one over here where uh, the noise from the outside world is gone. It's a monastery. Uh, and people can go there and be happy because that's the way their brainstem is set up. They can't really say, well, you shouldn't be that way. Well, I am that way. Yeah. <laughs> but and other people can jump into New York City and throw bombs about. Yeah. Or, yeah. you know, they can, uh, you know, in invent AIs that, that turn everything on its head. Um, you know, so that's, that's, that's cool. Yes. It's the cosmic soup of reality, I suppose. Yeah, which makes it really mm -hmm. interesting. Yeah, and, and and just being a part of it is very humbling too. I've been doing a, a bit of a deep dive into Stoicism and Marcus Aurelius and Epictetus and all this stuff. It's been really interesting to think about these interesting people from the past with their burdens of their reality and how they coped with it. Have you looked into much of that stuff at all? Stoicism? Not, re not really Stoicism. Um, I definitely got into Roman history, I think, through the Foundation series because, you know, the Foundation was, you know, basically modeled on uh, the late Republic, early Empire, you know, you know, in that transition. Yeah, Foundation, so, the science fiction, like, yeah, novel Asimov, series, right? Yeah, yeah. yes, yes. Yeah. Not, not, not the TV show. The TV show, I watched one episode and couldn't handle it. <laughs> <laughs> why don't you say what you really think yeah how, how do you how, how do you process uh yeah i'm actually really curious of this uh, how do you process the influx of like um because I, I i your social media posts make me laugh in the best of ways because you're like a deer a horse or something. and i love that but then sometimes you get into this is my thinking on this thing and then i'm willing to share my thoughts on this how, what, what entertains you at this point? Like, do you find entertainment in the common ground of, you know, television shows? And if so, what, what is it? Entertainment. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> what is this? E, this E lettered word that you speak. Of? <laughs> <laughs> what enter? Okay. Well, if it's not television, maybe it is. What, what, what do you do for entertainment? Well, I haven't, I have not had a TV since 1990. Wow. This is amazing. Um, That's a good yeah, thing. I, and my kids don't, they didn't grow up anywhere near it. Wow. That's awesome. So, so you and your wife were like, nah, we're not into it. We were not into it. That's a full departure from society. Yeah. It, I, I, I did never really looked at it that way. I don't even think about it. But when I go and visit my, my parents, the TV is on 24 seven. Yeah. And I'm like, this is an incredible cesspool. I mean, it has degenerated even further. Oh, yeah. It's than, horrible. Oh, it, it is. Yeah, a race to the bottom of the brainstem. Yeah, yeah. It's, I mean, to be fair, I, I, my wife and I, this is one of the things that she, she enjoys television to a certain level, and um, we find common ground on television shows that we watch. And to be fair, the level of entertainment, if you find the right one, is is really quite poetic and very incredible. Yeah, absolutely. Like there's, there's some yeah, I mean, true art being made, whatever you however you look at it. But yeah, for yeah, the most part, my my I wife know. got into um, Miss Maisel and absolutely loved it. And I was looking out at the incredible design work and you know the artistry with which that show is made. But unfortunately, that is few and far between. Yeah. So I, mean, I, I guess more fortunately. It, it's, it's, it's not true to say, you know, we don't have TV, you know, we might get a streaming service to look at a very specific thing. Like I did try to watch the foundation and immediately canceled the subscription because <laughs> it, uh, did you it, know, it has mark? very, it did not hit the mark at yeah. all. Yeah. You know, it, I mean, I just love Asimov's very deadpan way of, of doing things. Mm -hmm. And it just, the whole thing seemed to be sexed up to become a, a tv show yeah yeah it's uh but some people are saying no you need to give it another try man it's really pretty good <laughs> like uh yeah. yeah well if you just don't love something or if it doesn't hit you it's just the, the line i always use so i can be somewhat indifferent to it is it's just not for me 
usually yeah, helps. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Yeah. And not everything is designed for me. That would be like the weirdest egotistical <laughs> thought, you know. <laughs> no. It's like I don't I don't confuse what good with what I like. Mm, that's good. Yeah. And I think a lot of people do that. And that's a yes. mistake. Yes. Yes. Uh there's great I this is one thing that I had a problem with for a while. And I think social media in general has put a microphone and a speaker amplifier to everybody's voices of opinions and to talk back earlier about what you were saying about people putting their flag in the sand and saying this is a rule this is my rule therefore i'm uh, uh, an authoritarian on this rule and you listen to me you know and this is the rules of composition or this is the rules of society or life or whatever and and, and the facts is that to to at least you and i we admit and acknowledge that there is no rule there's um some things to consider but yeah there is i mean no it rules. makes it very difficult to be a teacher because i mean yes. what do you say yeah when i was doing I, when i was a part of learn squared we would do these uh, critiques basically like where the student would ask me what i thought of their work and i tell you it's one of the hardest things that i could have done because part of me was like who are you to reduce this person down to your pattern of thinking doesn't you're yeah. not you're not a you're not God. <laughs> and so like, I, I don't I, want you to do work like me. Why are you trying to learn from me? Yes. Yes. And this is an interesting conundrum for you because you have been a part of this legacy as I see it with digital art and you have kind of opened the floodgates for a lot of artists in a, in a really good way, but it also makes you the person that potentially should know a lot of the answers. Correct. <laughs> loaded question Me, a lot of the answers no. <laughs> yeah i i i was in the right place at the right time with the right training yeah yeah timing and it could have been it it could have been anybody you think so absolutely <laughs> why wasn't it anybody else other than you though Does well it had to be timing? somebody <laughs> i mean it's like somebody's you know like uh you know in a hundred thousand person football stadium and gets turned into a small pile of, of black ash by a lightning strike. It's like, well, why that person? What an analogy. Oh, you know, an analogy. like, yeah, a it, was, it was just strike. me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and, but, you know, that's ridiculous saying that it was even one person. You know, the, with the siege in forums, um, it, was an, it was an odd uh, occurrence where I think that people sense the heart you know, not not to be woo woo on yeah, you but get woo -woo they, they sense that the, 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 there was there was something happening on those forums mm. there was something new there was something and, and a whole bunch of artists came there like they heard a siren at a you know a frequency that's below audio but but the, their artistic uh limbic system could hear it and they all we all just came there we all knew why we were there mm. And we figured out how to paint with Photoshop. <laughs> this and is woo-woo and I love I, it. It's totally woo-woo. But I think that, you know, <laughs> probably, you know, I had just graduated from, from Art Center and Industrial Design and Illustration. And I probably had the technical background to make faster progress than most of the people there. A lot of them were Swedish. <laughs> and they were all, you know, like teenagers, you know, without formal education in art. But they're all sharp as a tack, and they knew exactly what was going on. Um, so yeah, that that was it was it was a, a brief moment in time, but that happens with so many different art movements. Like a particular cafe in Paris, all these weird people just start showing up for some reason that nobody can quite understand, and they come up with a new way of putting things together. Mm. Yeah, You're talking about Dadaism or something, or the. Yeah, I mean something like that, or cubism, or any other ism you might want to think yeah. about. You know, it's it German. And the weird thing is, is you know, so sometimes the same movement can happen uh, in different places at the same time, totally independent of one another, just because the time, you know, the the wave of culture and knowledge and research is at that point that these things can spontaneously arise. It seems like a an obvious putting together of components and that was true with, with you know painting in photoshop okay we've got 24-bit color we have fast computers and uh you know we could probably even paint with this 
as opposed to simply manipulating photographs. Mm. Yeah. It seemed like a, uh, you, you know, like, okay, we've got a surfboard, we have a traction kite. I bet you we could get dragged around by these two things, but it took 50 years to put those two things together because they existed separately for, for decades until somebody put it together. Yeah. It's like, uh, the bone inside of a 2001 space odyssey, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. And you know, I just, I'm always thinking, you know, like how many things are just walking right by us oh, like elephants that infinite. we don't even see infinite. Man. It's infinite. It's infinite, yeah. man. You might walk past somebody in your daily operation that could change your yeah. life and change the lives of everybody, and you don't even know it, and they don't even if know you, it either. You just like you know, have have the the curiosity and the inquisitiveness and the mental energy to think about it. Mm. Yeah, well, it is overwhelming because it's and it is. Yeah, <laughs> but that's where you know, like the the the, the ten, you know, the the uh, um the. Well, I'm telling you the uh, tolerance for chaos comes in mm. is you have to kind of put aside these rules that make life easier to live mm. and just accept that there's something that I don't understand that I might be able to understand if I really worked at it with a lot of effort mm. uh, could really change my life as opposed to going back to, I know what I've got here. I know that it works. But, you know, on the other hand, you know, I spent a lot of time trying to be other people. Mm. And How much of your life did you spend doing that? I would say 10 years. Mm. That's a solid chunk and very honest. I think most of us spend that much or more. Yeah. Yeah. Who was the people so, that you, you know, were like, I want to be that person because it's comfortable oh, to follow? Because I think, you know, all the people like, Say, for instance, when CGM was around, it was uh, right around 2000 to say 2005. And, you know, I put all my paintings on the web at high resolution. People started reverse engineering them. The early ones were look, looked like clones of me. And then people started to go off in different directions with it and do amazing things that I never envisioned or never saw. Some of the things in retrospect, like we're talking about elephants walking by <laughs> that you don't even notice, you know, like Alberto, you know, he said, you know, okay, well, yeah, I learned a lot from you. And, you know, and I remember, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like, uh, you know, doing, you know, he said, you know, he, he was influenced by what I was doing at the time. And then this style that he developed, you know, I kind of played around with it a bit, but it didn't go anywhere because I didn't see the elephant walking by, but he did. Yeah. And, uh, and he took it with it and ran with it. So, you know, there's like Alberto times 50 mm. of people out there doing amazing things and going off in different directions. And I'm kind of still stuck here doing what I did. And then I try to, you know, go and, and look you know, at you. Like, you're not stuck. They look at you. You're in the moving team. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, yeah, I mean, I just want to track them down and eat their liver, you know, to get their, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like that's where the magic is that? too. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's where the magic is, baby. Yeah. Well, a lot of iron too. So yeah. that's, that's good. Eat the livers. Um, <laughs> but so, so, but the thing is, is, you know, you can, you're not that person. You're not that equation. You're not that background. You're not that. You never can be. You can only be you. It's a trivial task and, but, to be anybody about yourself and everybody else has it. So just do your thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, do your thing. And, you know, I guess allow yourself to be influenced, but realize that trying to be somebody else or being overly influenced that way can be really difficult. But I yeah. think that's also truer for uh, older people. When you're younger, imitation is a way that you learn. And yeah. I don't think that you should be, that you should feel bad. You know, how oh, go on, be original. You know, some, some people are just original born that way. Yeah. And, that they're just amazing. Other people, they imitate to learn. And that's totally fine because you will move on from that. Yeah. You're, Ten you're years. Not, but yeah, but you know, <laughs> still, the, but there are people that you know, I, I kind of feel bad for, like, you know, the Frazetta imitators. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Frazetta like had it, a line that I love and it hit me hard when I first read it. He said, why be a second rate Frazetta when you can be a first rate you? Yeah, and I exactly. Love that. I mean, because, yeah. But there are people yeah. that just love his work so much, they spend their entire life trying to replicate it yeah. exactly. Yeah. And but they just then, live you in know, the shadow. Yeah. Yeah. But you, you could, but look, look at somebody like Boris, who started out with Rosetta and then did his own thing. You may yeah. like or dislike Boris's work, but at least it, it, it did evolve from that. 
yeah. or devolve, you know, depending on how you might look at it. <laughs> sure. And that's again, subjectivity too, which is interesting. It totally is. And yes. we can only hope that Boris himself uh, found a wonderful place for it, him and his art and his creations and his purpose in life. But yeah, you know, you mentioned that some people are born original and yeah. I would say, and this is a devil's advocate, everyone is born original. The choice to be unoriginal is the choice. Do you agree? Mm. Let's chew on that one. It's sure. interesting. I I think, I, I, I think that there's some some brains that are wired in such a way that um some I mean, but th think about like authoritarian minds. The, the, they just seem to be wired into, and, and it gets back to the tolerance for chaos versus stability. Mm. And I think there are some people that just on that continuum want the certainty, and it gets back to you know whether or not they ever went hungry as a baby. <laughs> you know that might have something to sure. do with that deep level of conservatism. Yeah, nature and nurture um, kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, if if you ever uh, you know had trauma as a child, perhaps you might be a lot more conservative yeah, and treat to things a, be much more adverse to change. So mm -hmm. the question of whether or not somebody chooses to be original or not, um, that could be, but maybe uh, you know you're uh, supposing free will there. But I I think that probably somebody who does very uh, conservative academic art um and are quite happy doing that they're probably doing that and they didn't even have a choice mm. yeah it's interesting i guess my, my how i say my I like how that. i might answer that question yeah i appreciate that perspective I actually um just thinking about what you just said there and the choice of that i i, I guess that does come down to the age-old question is there such thing as free will some people think so and yes. some people don't and you know, I'm on the fence. Sometimes I think so. And then like you just said right there, and then my brain goes, well, that's a good point. <laughs> you know, like that's <laughs> definitely a poss possibility. There is no such free will that everything is predestined or at least like, let's say it's 49% and 51%. And, it, and on any given day, it shifts from 49 to 51 and it's constantly yeah. in flux. And that means that neither perspective is true. It just depends on the situation. And that's context, right. right? So it's like, damn. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, I kind of look at, you know, being a deterministic engineer, uh, you probably could suppose that I don't do not believe in free will. Mm. But on the other hand, have you ever noticed or ever ever seen you know, caught yourself observing yourself? Um, and sure. So there's there's like a dissociation. You're creating another entity outside of yourself. Hmm. And it's um, in transactional analysis. That's why, you know, like a, a therapist will say to a, a, a client, you know, you know, why were you doing this? And the person has to answer why. So in, so in a sense there, you have three shells on top of one another hmm. that's observing this this thing behaving that we assume had no free will and trying to ascertain, you know, why did it do this? And, but that doesn't answer the question is, okay, I saw myself doing this. I'm an alcoholic. I saw myself drinking. Could I stop? Mm. I don't, I, I don't really know the answer to that, but mm. I guess, you know, using dissociation to control yourself, if, if you make the shell far enough, could you overcome the brainstem that's causing the, the 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 base construction to misbehave? Yeah, maybe so. But yeah, it it it's an interesting psychotherapy tool. Um, and yeah, but I get back to my original point. I'm a determinist. Free will is absolutely an illusion. Mm. That's interesting. And and I know that people are gonna you know be very upset with me for that. Why? Uh, <laughs> Well, it gets back to, uh, I mean, both people like theologic, if, if theological people and, and artistic people, they want to believe that there is something, you know, magical there. I'm just really think about it. No, there can't be. There isn't. What think of what what you're saying, and 
So <laughs> you think it's a miscommunication I, of logic or is that just a miscommunication in general when people say something like that? Uh, or both. <laughs> I, yeah. I, 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 I really don't know. I mean, I, I really think that, you know, people say yes. And, you know, how many Americans say that they're, you know, uh, like angels are, are real or ghosts are real and they very well could be. Or and God. if they are, if they are, if they are real, uh, we can detect them, understand them, understand the mechanisms by which they function. Mm. And, you know, the old quote is any technology is sufficiently advanced is magic. Um, and, but as I said earlier, you know, magic is just a simplistic way of understanding something you don't yet understand, which is very similar to where we are with composition. So yeah, all kinds of weird phenomena goes on and we will be able to understand it one day, but not right now. But, but supposing that there is something truly supernatural, really stop and think about that because there isn't, there can't be. <laughs> it, it is something that we can understand, but its true nature is so complex. Yeah, it has theory. the appearance, yeah. it, 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 it has the appearance of magic, but mm. it isn't. Mm. I had a moment and I, maybe you've had this before as well. I had a moment, I was, uh, I was out taking photographs in the morning. I was actually shooting film and I had this, my camera set up and everything. And I was with my friend, Anthony, we were, at, we went out and did like this week long sabbatical where we traveled around through like barren areas in Southern California and the nature and all that stuff was fantastic. And I was sitting mm -hmm. there and we were on this empty vacant no one was around lake bed and it was like kind of muddy and all the all the fog was just sitting there and you could hear the nature the animals coming to life and then the sun revealed itself slightly the earth rotated and there was this moment where i became really emotional and i thought to myself uh, i'm not i'm kind of in the realm where you are with these things where i um i couldn't really get into religion in many ways for the factual things and my brain couldn't logically compute things. And then I was having a problem with that. But this was the first time in my whole life that I, I sat there and I said, I think this is my religion. I think like seeing these things and like experiencing nature yes. and this depth of love and empathy yes. is really where it, it's like, it shook me to my core and it was a real deep personal spiritual moment where yes. I was just present in the moment. And it's hard to do that uh, for me. Uh, it was, but I imagine living in the on the Aina, and there's a reason why you're in Hawaii. Hawaii's nature is, it literally will not let you not see it because it's so right. prevalent and it's so humbling and it's so incredibly beautiful. It's like a wonderful work of art, basically. <laughs> uh, it is. Yeah. So that's what I, I would say I is magical. Because <laughs> the, the emotions yeah. that you are having though are they are legacy reactions that had a survival advantage in earlier versions of humans. And the fact that they exist, I do not deny. And they, they have their, and they are quite awesome to experience. But the thing is, is like when you first understand calculus, do you have the same reaction? I, I do. I suppose you could. Yeah, depending yeah, on if it gives absolutely. you the, the release of, of, of mental strain. Like, oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> I mean, and when you finally understand something and it's more, you know, like the true nature of, of, of life and how it works is generates the same reaction in me as a more direct mystical experience. You know, I'm standing here right now looking at my window. I'm looking at Haleakala. Mm. And I see was... everything that is growing out there. And, you know, one thing is everything that I'm looking at is non-native, for one, which is fascinating to me, which a lot of people have a problem with. But that's just actually I take that back. There's a fern, a bank of ferns right over here that that is the only thing that I can see right now that's native. <laughs> well, the lava, too, right? The the land itself. But I can't, I can't see any, any lava. Yeah, yeah. Just yeah. the plants yeah. completely taken over. Yeah. Um, but well, anyway, those yeah, have been brought in that. by humans, which is still natural, right? Is that what you're talking about? Well, yeah, that, that's the way I look at it. We're naturally unnatural. That's natural. what it is. Yeah. 
yeah that, that that is we we are part of nature and what we do is and if you give up free will then you give up agency which means we are a natural force that's right and and we are speeding up the rate of change in this uh enclosed environment yeah and that's going to lead to a greater monoculture uh less diversity but when the rate of change drops then diversity goes up mm -hmm. oh interesting things. so you know i'm i'm not too concerned about human beings and their effect on the environment uh, i think we're you know probably got a whiff of our under armors thinking that we can actually harm the planet we can probably harm ourselves but <laughs> we can't harm the planet <laughs> and even then it, it kind of brings the you know the value judgment of is an earth covered by rocks better or worse than one covered by life? I mean, I, I, I suppose, I love these you know, striking if, thoughts. <laughs> if, if, if you, if you want to look at it, like in terms of value and complexity, yes, life is say the universe's attempt at reversing the second law of thermodynamics by making spontaneous complexity where there was no through the input of energy into a closed system. Yeah. Then life is a better than rocks. But uh, on the other hand, that's all we're talking about is complexity of arrangement. <laughs> Isn't that, I guess, a logical view of of us? I guess. In the yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We're, yeah, we're, we're, we're you know very 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 complex. But then you know I might say, well, at a quantum level, rocks and life are just as complex as each other. So you're back to the original conundrum yes. of well, we're why just, even bother? Or we're just like balls of energy, as you mentioned. You know. <laughs> moving yeah. and, 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 and moving through time and space, which is interesting. And then the concept of time, which I'm going to put that on my notes to talk about, but like, continue with your thought. I didn't mean to interject. You were talking about your view outside of oh. Uh Well, yeah, I can't remember in what context I was. Oh, <laughs> that, I, I was just talking about, you know, your uh, spiritual experience mm. in the lake in California. And yeah. I'm, you know, I look at this and, and just, you know, I think it's easy to take those kind of mystical reactions as aesthetic reactions and think that they are in and of themselves not explainable. Mm. Oh, I can and explain And then people it. say, yeah, but then they say, if you do explain it, it lessens it. And um, that's where I would kind of disagree yeah. with, with a lot of people. I could see that being, well, okay. So it's like, um. Uh, I don't want to, I'm trying to avoid saying stupid stuff here, but <laughs> so yeah. Ah, oh, go ahead. Yeah. I mean, every, almost every other word is just some kind of stupid stuff that comes out of my body. So, well, okay. So I guess I think the, the reason why I could see that form of thinking. So if we were to take in that deeply intimate moment of revelation for me and saying, mm -hmm. oh, it was just like, it was just the sun coming up and then burning off the, this and that there was a, there I don't know if I wouldn't use magical. I would and I wouldn't I don't know if I'd use spiritual, but I would just say that there was a moment of so if if it's a little bit of context, I work all the time. I'm workaholic, my identity is wrapped in my ego that works and so on and so forth. And I'm making up for past trauma, whatever it is. There's some sort of mm -hmm. issue. You know? So when I take okay. a moment to get out of my office and, and really look at nature and see it for what it is. So I was I was there because I was like I'm gonna capture this on the camera, but obviously that does a disservice to what it is because it's a copy of a copy of a thing through a machine, which is not even capturing it. <laughs> so it's almost right. like redundancy. But then when I was there and I was in the moment, I was looking at it and I was really present. I was just shocked and reminded of, don't lose yourself. You know, be present. Like be able to see the beauty even when it's not beautiful if that makes sense and that's kind of what i'm getting at and that's what really kind of shook me and i couldn't i i could sit here and articulate it and, and break it down and that doesn't reduce its its beauty to me I, if anything as i mentioned the challenge of that of questioning these things actually makes it greater because then i can start yeah. to go oh what was happening is like my brain was firing all these neurons and these crazy patterns were happening this dopamine drop and all this technically stuff it doesn't diminish how it felt to me, you know, but I'm no, because absolutely. I'm confident in the the feeling that I had. So yeah. Well, why don't you? How about turning your experience on its head with another individual? Say you took somebody out of uh, the Highlands of New Guinea, and <laughs> and you brought them to Los Angeles, mm. and you took them up to the top of the Bonaventure 
and gave him a nice stiff drink at $50 a drink and, and with the rotating restaurant and told him, look out at this. This is what human beings have created. They would probably have a similar experience to yours. Yeah. Well, I mean, who knows, right? But yeah, I mean, uh, that's a... If they could even understand it. Yes. You know? Yeah. So, but but my point is, is that the the difference there is you going and seeing something extremely different than your normal experience. Okay. Yeah. Contrast. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So I, but I, so I don't mean, or I guess maybe what I'm cautioning against is coming to the conclusion that this experience you had was fantastic because it was uh, in and of itself, firsthand nature. You know, I, I, I had a firsthand uh, sensory experience with nature. Some people see that all the time and they're sick of it. Mm -hmm. And they want to go see a Broadway play. Sure. And yeah. that would give them the same thing the other way. So no, it's it like the, you know, the brain yeah, the, the brain wants novelty and these reactions are caused by novelty. Mm -hmm. Which is why, you know, people I think everybody needs to travel around and do things differently because it, it really is a, a, a good thing. I don't get out as much as I should. I don't think anybody ever could. This is the truth. I mean you could, you yeah. could try, but even when you do are you Wouldn't really present done. and seen? Yes, exactly. Yeah. And also life, as you mentioned, I think that's really the core thing is that there was such a level of contrast that my brain was like, I haven't had this oxygen in years. Right. So thank you right. because I needed it. And then my, my body goes, oh shit, like you need to be more present and you need to be aware. And uh, yeah. that contrast was it. And as, as you said too, it's like I've been up to, I've been in areas where people just take the nature for granted. Cause they're just like, yeah, it's here, you know, whatever. Like, yeah. I mean, yeah. growing up in Hawaii, it's, everybody was taking it for granted, you know, it tried to kill me yesterday. I'm sick of nature. Yeah. And which is understandable <laughs> as, as nature does. Nature goes, Hey, yeah. uh, no, yeah. <laughs> nature says, right. Uh, nature is very uh, factual and it's an approach to, to how it operates. It just goes, yeah. this is pretty much, uh, this is how it goes, you know? So, and someone from Appalachia may, you know, come to New York city and say, gosh, I need to start studying structural engineering. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Don't take for granted what human beings have created. So yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's novelty. Yeah. Contrast. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the human experience is insane. And this is like, I'm sure the people that are listening, if you're last, if you've lasted through this level, this, <laughs> this hour of, uh, <laughs> word Korean salad conundrums, uh, yeah. Uh, you're doing great. And, and this is really what I'm most interested in personally, because like, yeah, we could talk about the, surface level crap i really love and adore that you're willing to go into these things and get into this stuff because truly these are the conversations that will have some sort of value i would imagine you know beyond like the surface level things when you first got into how how did you get introduced to art like what was what was the thing do you have a memory of like the first moment that it hit you and struck you hmm yeah, I remember um, spending summers in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. Mm, beautiful up there. My family. Yeah, and uh, we really had a great time there. And, um, you know, as a result of those summers, both uh, my uh, brother and sister, you know, are, are living in that area. Um, but there's a painter named Jim Wilcox who... Uh, painted almost exclusively in the Jackson Hole area. He's got a, a gallery right outside of Jackson. Um, and he's been working, he's probably quite old now. Uh, he's been painting the Tetons in Jackson Hole for 50 years. And my parents loved that, that area so much. And they were kind of, uh, I, I, they, they were looking at it as kind of like postcards, something to remind them of pleasant summers. I don't think they were, they bought them for the art, but they also bought them as, investments but i remember going up to the paintings up close and seeing how they were simply abstract marks and then getting back and they were magical reflections of uh wonderful summers spent on jackson lake but at a granular le granular level they were nothing they were just paint very skillfully done and ordered and i remember you know that that connection between um, nothing and something, you know, it really kind of said that that's quite amazing. And then I wanted to try that. I wanted to create that magic myself. Can I just make marks on a paper that have an emotional impact? And, uh, that's kind of where it started, I think. Mm. 
And then I remember get, you know, seeing Sargent's work for the first time in that wonderful Abbeville Press book. And what impressed me the most was him painting nonsense things, you know, back alleys and, you know, a garbage can lid. And just that, you know, that amount of skill could be put to just the physical beauty of the object, you know, kind of redefined what art could be for me. Mm. Helped you and, see you know, something differently? Is that what it is? Yeah, I, I did. I guess I it, it kind of taught me that you know beauty is where you find it. You know, it it is it is everywhere. It's not like everywhere. well, I'm I I just have my sketch pad here, and I'm going to be going out into the wilderness and trying to find a composition that looks just like uh, that Monet guy. And I mean, you see that composition? Yeah, okay. Now this looks like no, it's it's right there. It's the weed in the ditch. It's always there. Yeah. yeah, it's always there around you, and yeah, you know, that's pretty cool. And, and you know, but I still, I'm I, I'm studying the, the mechanisms of art and and people who have mastered it up to the level that we understand it quite a bit to understand how those emotional manipulations are made and what works and what doesn't. Um, because you know the, the skill in doing that, you know, like Rockwell, he, he was uh, you know people probably may, maybe look at him as somewhat of a. Uh, a swarmy uh, mm, sentimental painter of American life, but no, he he was extremely uh, uh, sophisticated. knew exactly the manipulations he was making in his art. Oh yeah, that's all borderline propaganda. If you look yeah, at it, it is. Yeah, it is. is not, I'm not trying to deface done. it at all. I think it's brilliant work for the most part, depending yeah. on the piece, of course, and. And it's easy for us to judge, uh, you know, judgments, uh, hindsight's twenty twenty always with this kind of stuff. And yeah, and who knows what his intention is. And then his intention really has no merit if unless that's the, what you're feeling. So it's just all, you know, a, a muddle of soup. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I'm, it, that's well, really he definitely. That's, he definitely worked, you know, he knew his audience. He knew how to get to their brainstem and he knew how to sell something, which made him one of the most successful illustrators ever. Yeah. Yeah. And like, you know, the people that made the little red haired girl in prison, they did their job well because I just keep on bouncing on that buy button and I can't stop. Mm. I buy frozen uh, merchandise without even knowing it. I wake up in the middle of the night and find myself in front of the computer with a little red haired girl staring at me saying, buy, 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 buy. <laughs> yeah, you got and some, I do. You got, you got a frozen addiction going on here. Yeah. I'm just kidding. None, none of this is true. <laughs> I'm glad you said that because where everybody's yeah. gonna think that you're just addicted to Frozen, and then we're gonna all be no, sending but, you but, links to the songs. <laughs> but, but the but the point is, is that you know the the people that made her did her did that very skillfully. Yeah, and I'm not course. sure that their motives were entirely pure. Yeah. Well, no, of course not. And 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 <laughs> as and as those people be get pure? better, as those people get better at their craft and say say an ai will be able to put together uh models of the target client oh, yeah. you know detailed psychological profiles oh yeah it will then be able to that's coming soon you know, man <laughs> ma mass master every aspect of it so the, the this idea of it completely bypassing my my frontal brain yeah. is coming and the ai is going to hasten that it's going to oh it's already make happened. Yeah, yeah ma manipulate your brain in ways that completely. And that's always where I have problems with, like the '60s protest songs. You know, like okay, they're trying to bypass my rational faculty to get me to have an opinion by putting it to song that has an earworm to it. Yeah, that's an assault. Yeah, well, it's a mental. But anytime yeah. you you <laughs> you try to change my behavior without my consent, that is an assault. Mm -hmm. And that's one thing I absolutely love about Maui is there is no billboard advertising here at all. Yay. I love that. And also love like the island of Kauai as well. It's one of my other favorite islands in the chain of Hawaii. Um, that there's no, that at, at night, all the lights, the big, the, the main lights are turned off because of the, yes. there's a bird that's native there that they found out was flying into them and killing itself. And it would be him an endangered species because of the light. So they turn off the lights at night, which I absolutely love. And I think it's a fantastic thing, and I and I and I hope it stays that way. <laughs> well, also, yeah. you know, you can you can see the Milky Way a lot better. Oh, like yeah. you can I mean, anyway in Hawaii very easily. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's uh, let's talk about this uh, weaponizing of art. I think this is a very interesting topic. We should we'll probably alienate ourselves from a lot of things, but hey, let's do it anyways, right? So, 
<laughs> just stick our foot right in. Let's put our foot and our head right into it and our and our and and, and ruin it. So, uh, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, okay. So let's talk about a. Um, and this is a conundrum that I encounter and you encounter and we have to encounter because we have lives where we uh, live amongst this system with money and in, is in, in, is interacted with us and we work on commissions and work for clients and, and so on and so forth. And when art meets consumption through the vice of capitalism or whatever you want to say, it's interesting. It's hard to, it's hard to navigate that. How, how have you navigated your career to where you can maintain your personal sovereignty and have you through these years? Mm, I don't think I have. Yeah. Honest. I love um, it. <laughs> yes. uh, no, Same. I'm, I'm, you know, it, it's, it, but you know, I, I don't, I, I don't, I do not have a, a negative view of money at all. Mm. I think money is uh, amazing. Yeah. It's a crazy and construct. It's really fantastically it, interesting. It, it, it is, yeah. you know, and, and I'm, I'm trying to think about, you know, what, what money is, is simply a vote. A dollar is a vote. And what you're voting on is what 8 billion people do when they get up in the morning. Interesting. So, I never heard of it like that. It is. It, it is a voting system. Hmm. And if I'm Jeff Bezos, I have a lot of votes and a lot of people do what I tell them to do because I have that money. Hmm. Now, if you attach a person's having money to some type of wisdom or knowledge or competence, then that's probably good. But, uh, you know, clearly people, um, you know, their, their values might be corrupt and that leads to people that are not very wise getting lots of money. And that's probably not very good, but it's a bit self-correcting. Mm. Um, so I, I look at the whole commerce and capitalistic side of it as uh, it is best for us as a collective that things are organized this way because we do have the non-trivial task of keeping 8 billion of us alive and uh, mechanization, industrialization, I think are pretty necessary. I think, you know, going, going, uh, you know, wanting to turn back the clock, becoming more agrarian, that can't happen with this many people. Yeah, that's not um, possible. Yeah. It's not possible. It's not and we have a pretty, to, yeah, yeah. And, you know, with, with globalization, the, the, the flow of money from, you know, all the people like, you know, I grew up in Ohio. I saw the effects of globalization firsthand. But what people in the Midwest don't see is how the money that they used to make is now flowing all over the world and is creating a larger middle class. And that's good for humanity, but bad for the industrial Midwest. Um, but now that creates a larger consumer class, which is, you know, making more emissions and other problems. But those are simple engineering problems um, and can be solved fairly easily. And they are in the process of being solved. So, you know, in, in, I don't, the, the, the capitalist system and the way things are set up, like I said earlier, the world's in pretty good shape from the way I look at it. Mm. And yes, things can be done differently and they should be done differently as we modify things, but the basic foundation is good. And we are on the track of hopefully isolating ourselves from uh, natural cataclysms, which will you know, destroy all life on earth in the blink of an eye. Say if there was a, a supernova and in the, in, in the arm of the Milky Way closest to us, you know, we'd have what, maybe 20 years before the atmosphere is stripped away. <laughs> yeah. And uh, solar so, you know, or something. A, yeah. a, a, a modern capitalistic, you know, have you ever heard of the Kardashev scale? Uh-uh. How do you spell that? Uh, Kardashev is a, a Russian uh, physicist that categorized uh, civilizations by uh, 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 a percentage of solar output that they can command. I see it. Okay. K A R D A S H E V scale. Okay. okay. Yeah. 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 Um, of course, it's a Russian, you know, that... <laughs> a Russian yeah. brain coming up with this wild stuff. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, you know, the, the idea is that, uh, yes, the, the, the modern system and the way we are in and how that does support uh, science you know, as an inquiry, we are on track to increasing 
our place on that scale, which is the only way that we will survive at all. Mm. Because if we go backwards, we're simply waiting for the universe to kill us, <laughs> which will happen. Yeah, as yeah. just the sun will eventually the, the uni- burn out and so on and so forth. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, even in less time than that. Like I'm sitting well, here on the north shore of Maui, and if you look at the north shore of Molokai, uh, there are three thousand foot cliffs there. And that happened because both Oahu and Molokai, at a certain point, when they move far enough off the hotspot, uh, you get a landslide, something the size of Connecticut slides into the ocean. Mm-hmm. Like there, there's things the size of a, a of a city 40 miles off the coast of Oahu that used to be part of Oahu. Mm-hmm. And so I, so from Makoau down here, all this is going to slide into the ocean at some point, hopefully not while I'm on it, but <laughs> it's, it's going to happen. And respecting the Aina is going to have nothing to do with that. <laughs> Absolutely nothing to do with that. How dare you say such a thing? <laughs> <laughs> but that doesn't mean we should, you know, rape the planet either. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's a concept too. Yeah, that but is a concept. Know, so, but yeah, the, the idea that, uh, you know, it, it's kind of semi-magical, semi-mystical feeling that if we respect the universe, it will respect us. That no, doesn't give and a there, shit about us. Yeah. It doesn't give a shit about us. And <laughs> How could it? It's not so, a human being. <laughs> so, you know, we, but then there, there, there are, you know, a, a book I just read recently was uh, Three Body Prop. Oh, yes. I've is, heard many great things. I still haven't read that. Yeah. Yet. And, and you know, the, the, the idea, which is fascinating, is both these two planets learn about each other. The Earth and, and Alpha Centauri learn about each other. Mm. And the first instinct of both planets is to have a large movement of self-hatred, of saying, of we're idealizing the other planet. They need to come here and, and fix all of our problems. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, mm. the conservative elements say that you betrayed your race. Mm. Yeah. But, uh, you know, th- there's, there is a type of self-hatred going on when like, okay, I want this, this civilization, this species to continue. And, uh, and I'm, I, I think that we're on a plan for having that, actually controlling our environment uh, completely, which we would have to do if we want to continue. Other people are like, no, we should go back and live like hobbits because, I don't know, I just remember that that's what we're supposed to do, or that's natural. <laughs> and, you know, we've already said, you know, like, what the hell does natural mean? Mm, well, yeah. You know, so uh, well, People say we're unnatural, we, but I, if, I say if, we if are we, natural. Yeah. If we go extinct, we go extinct. That's, that's natural. Just, that's, the, that's the natural thing. And yeah. some people are okay with that. And yeah. I guess that that is at least consistent. Yeah. As long as they know that they are making that choice, that they are resigning us to oblivion. Well, you're saying and there is all, no choice. All this, <laughs> there is no choice. If we want to continue, we have to continue the way we are doing. Yeah. And other people are like, no, the universe will look after us if we treat with respect. I'm saying, oh, no, that, that is not true. This is not true. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. but if people say, I want an agrarian life, oh, that's cool. I accept the fact that uh, I am consigning the human race to destruction, but I want an agrarian life because it fits with my aesthetics. Yeah. Great. Okay, that at least you're acknowledging the costs that you're incurring on people that haven't even been born yet. Yeah, that's true. That's, I actually never thought of it like that. You, enc- I encounter a lot of people in Hawaii that have that outlook on life. Uh, I, I I tend to keep my mouth shut. <laughs> well, I mean, if it's if you have if 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 you know you're going to cause somebody personal harm, you might as well just not even say it because it's like, well, what what good is that doing if you're going to. But yeah, at the same yeah. time, and, and the, this is what I love about this conversation is if we've offended you or made you upset or some sort of thing, maybe there's a some sort of truth that you're not willing to admit or just don't listen to us. You know, that's beautiful. That's a beautiful thing about you having a quote unquote free will, which is great. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Or I'll, I'll make the disclaimer. Everything that I said in, in this interview is wrong. Yeah. And mine too. And it's always been wrong or right. Who cares? It doesn't really matter. It's just a conversation <laughs> to be had. Uh, uh, yeah. amongst two human beings who are just flailing about through the cosmic soup but, of reality. <laughs> but, but, you know, uh, the interesting problem, though, is when we have to come up with uh, what do we do? Yes. Oh, this is such a recommendation. Conundrum. So, okay. Yeah. I, I acknowledge that I'm wrong, uh, but we still have to decide whether or not we should uh, log the Yukon. <laughs> yeah this is so now, uh, now it gets real baby yeah it does get real and then then you're like fuck you know i don't so okay let's talk about that for example or like when people are raping the aina the land and stuff it's like 
Right. My stance on that is, hey, don't do that. But at the same time, how am I to judge that? So I think intrinsically it cu- it should come down to why are we doing this? And if we don't, what is the cause of uh, our inaction, basically? I have a form of structure that I use. I've been working on trying to have a way of, of helping me um, assess how to, how to take in input and then see if it's worthy of my time. I have three choices, guiding choices as they come in. Do I need mm-hmm. this thing? What happens if I don't get it? And can I make do without it? And these are the three things that I usually do as a filtration system to help me decipher whether I do something or I don't, or I acquire something or I don't, so on and so forth. And I guess it, it, so to answer that question, that very difficult question is, do we need it? What's the cost if we don't have it? So on and so forth. And then, you know, you, you decide, okay, well, this makes sense that we need this. And this is the sacrificial thing we're willing to take all this thing out but you know this is the this is the cost every convenience has a cost you know so yeah yes yeah. you could look at it as a convenience or you could look at it as uh support for a technical culture that is learning things that make human life better and easier and not you could look at it as convenience and and that is an interesting scale is like at some point in the distant past, it wasn't a choice between convenience or hardship. It was, con- it was a choice between life and death. Mm. But then it became a choice between uh, a really difficult life and maybe a little bit longer life. Mm. And maybe now it's a choice between um, ostentatious luxury and obscene luxury. Yeah. And, uh, you know, like, <laughs> oh, so at what point, at what point do you say, no, the trees are worth it? And, you know, is a really complicated, you know, connection between those trees being chopped down, the paper being made, the ideas being written on the paper that support uh, research and understanding our world better, which would improve people's lives. You know, how do you actually make that equation? It's, it's very uh, complex. Super, and that's the form of, it's almost to the level of magic if if you try to quantify which is nebulous almost you know it's like like i said amongst you and your day to day you might walk past the elephant and not know it yeah right? and that's the chaos of but life and the interesting thing about it yeah. you do kind of wonder if ai might be able to it will uh, <laughs> to, to, to think yeah it, that's the answer to that question do i want is it possible it, yes <laughs> yes it, is it possible and the answer is yes and it and yeah. is it is it happening? The answer is it already has happened. It just hasn't been revealed yet. Yeah. This is my this is my take on it. It is it is the um, thing that gives birth and the thing that kills at the same time. This is my this is how I've I've kind of dealt with it personally. It's like a it's like a blade of of birth and death. <laughs> have and, you ever heard of a guy named Elezir Yudowski? How do you spell it? Uh, e l i a Lezier. Yudowski is how you would say it. Oh, yeah, uh, it. I'm not even sure if I'm American pronouncing it. Computer scientist. Yeah, I've, I've been following this guy for a long time. Mm-hmm. And he did some amazing fan fiction where he teaches uh, ideas about rationality uh, in Harry Potter fan fiction. Oh, yeah, I see and his Harry Potter I, stuff. I, I, I think what, you know, it's exactly the same troll is uh, what I've been doing with composition. It's like Im- embedding this idea in something that is so stupid, you know. <laughs> but anyway, he he has been. Um, um, I I his most recent long form statement was on uh, Lex Friedman Friedman podcast, mm-hmm. you know, where he talks about you know for three hours that AI will kill us all. There's no way around it. He's saying this. Liz, you're saying yeah. That? Hmm. Yes, he's saying that, that it will kill us, mm. and there, there's. What does he mean by kill? Been, like our physical body or everything about? Yes. About, okay. yes. Yeah. Basically, AI will come up with an idea of the of the universe that does not include human beings mm, mm, as part of its you know objective function, mm. and uh, it has nothing. It has nothing to do with uh, malevolence or no. It's um, just logic, I guess. Y- yeah, it has nothing to do with sentience. Mm. You know, it, probably the most the the, the older series, the Paperclip Maximizer, which you know he goes well beyond that, and 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 that podcast that I heard him speak at some length, but his ideas were compelling to me. I don't think they're completely right, but also 
I've heard people debating him, and I think he wins. Hmm. That's interesting. Oh, uh, look into I, 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 I don't, I don't find uh, people trying to refute him doing so successfully. Hmm. Um, so yeah, it's it's pretty pretty damn bleak. <laughs> and, yeah, and and you know, it's a it's a larger problem of you know how do you solve um, in in and then when you have accelerated uh, change and in the past we had generations eons to try things and to fail over and over and over at them, but the scale of like we're moving out on that Kardashev scale. The implications of our failures are much higher now. Mm. And we do not have the opportunity to be wrong and try again, be wrong and try again. And this is true for so many different, uh, you know, uh, uh, endeavors is we do not have the wiggle room to screw up anymore because there's a lot of us and we engender a lot of power and we have a lot of power. So, you know, now we we're, we're like a bull in a China shop and the bull is growing you know, in girth by two inches every day, hmm. pretty soon it'll be impossible to move without knocking something over. It is a problem. So, you know, I, I remember, I think in that podcast, he said something to the effect of they're, they're in like 1956 in the summer, they were going to, uh, the, the government said, okay, we want a bunch of you eggheads to go uh, at, at Yale or something and figure out artificial intelligence. And then in the, in, in the fall, you can come to us and, oh, we're gonna put two graduate students on the problem of human vision and come to us when you have a thinking machine. Thank you. And so then those researchers failed. And they failed again and again and again and again and again and again and again until I finally said, this problem is really hard. Mm. And Elizier's point is that uh, with alignment, we don't have the opportunity to fail. You have to get it right the first time. And that's not really reasonable. So uh, we don't yeah, have the best track works. record for such a thing. Yeah. No, I mean alignment is a hard problem, yeah. and you get one shot at it before you're dead. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so anyway, check that. Check out that. Yeah, you should I probably have down here. I, he has yeah, a book that's probably, called Inadequate uh, Equilibria, I would, which I already love the name of. I love that concept. <laughs> that's fantastic wording. Yeah, he, he's an amazing guy. He never went to high school or any mm. college, which I I he's also entirely... think is fantastic. Yeah. And, and yeah. it goes back to my personal take on art, which is, I don't think you can teach it. I think you can. I think you can 100% teach it. But should you? Maybe. No. Yeah. <laughs> I've had that problem. So many people say, hey, we, we need you to teach. And I'm like, oh, Christ. <laughs> I mean, hey, in all fairness, you can say, this is my mode, modus operandi. This is how I operate. This is how I do yeah. this from point A to point B. But right. what would be the biggest disservice to you and your I, yourself is for you to just follow this. This is one of the biggest conundrums that I encounter when I'm sharing my work publicly in social media or whatever is all the questions that come in. Hey, what brush did you use? I know this is uh -huh. a trigger button for you. Hey, what program did you use? What tablet did you use? What socks did you wear when you fucking painted right. this thing? None yep. of it fucking yep. matters. It does to a certain level, but it doesn't. Like right. the tool we cannot dismiss. This is something that I've talked at great length with many different artists, in my opinion, and I'd like to hear yours is you cannot dismiss that our art is dependent on technology and hardware and software. This, if, you yes. dis, if, if you remove that, there's no digital art. So you can't dismiss, dismiss that. But there is the other side of things, which is like you mentioned, the, and in your mind, if I can please jump in and tell me the way that you diagnose image making and you, you I almost engineer it and you use that artist understanding of image making and then you use the technology to then hopefully elicit some sort of emotional release from the viewer. Is this correct? Right. Yes. Yes. But I am doing that intuitively now, as we all are, because we have very limited understanding, but eventually it will be understood almost a level of pharmacology. Do you see it, the irony with AI image making now doing that basically? It's the elephant, <laughs> you know? No, yeah, uh, it, it is. It, 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 it is um, it's becoming 
formalized and yeah. we our, our monkey brains are not going to be up to the task of what of, of trying to resist what we have created not even close the moment i used yeah, so, the yeah. first training model on image like recreation i was like oh so the intent of making a pretty image which was the intent for most of us for a big amount of time is yeah. basically void <laughs> yes uh... I suppose so, yes. But then, you know, it, it also, it, it, it goes back to a question of value. Yes. Um, yeah. in, in terms of uh, the fact that a human being is a miracle, is that changed by the fact that there are 8 billion of them? <laughs> the scale, it's a scale issue then. <laughs> yeah, so you know, not only can this thing turn out, you know, a beautiful ping by Aang, um, and have beautiful living lines to it even it can do a thousand of them in a day yeah and well it turns it into a commodity yeah, yeah a very inexpensive commodity yeah and which just reduces and the not, stock. Not, but the thing is is it's really giving us a question you know again, it's forcing us to think which is yes, great i love that it's literally the thing and, that i came to realize it is making us think finally that yeah, it, isn't, it, it isn't just making a pretty picture. It's like, why are you making this? Right. Why? Why the yeah. fuck are you sitting here in this universe, this right now, pushing your pixels around? Why are you doing it? And that's a tough question to ask. And oftentimes, I don't even know. You know, I'm like, fuck, I don't know. I just want to like not think about anything else right now. I just want to do this. Do you trust? Do you trust yourself that either you don't know or that you find the answer extremely unpleasant? Both, I think both. Yeah, is. yeah, yeah. Yeah, I I try to you know avoid the stink of rationalization and kidding myself as much as I possibly can. <laughs> that you know I'm I'm quite open to the fact that the reason I did this is because I was a stupid monkey and I got endorphin hits out of <laughs> doing this parlor trick to bend two dimensions into three dimensions. Look at mm. that mom. Yeah. You know, but you know, on the end of it, yeah, I mean, I'm an, I'm an illustrator. Yeah. I am paid to sell sugar water to kids. Yeah. Yeah. And if I could do that <laughs> by just like taking a gun filled with some pharmacology and shooting it to them to bypass their brains, that they'll buy more Pepsi. I would have the same thing. Mm. And, you know, a lot of people I think would have, you know, a very, no, but you're, you're an artist. Mm. Well, I'm sure oh. there's going to be a lot of controversy about what we're saying if people are still listening, which is fine. This is good. They, yeah. yes, they are not listening. Yeah. Although I could, I, I could see like, wh wh what do you bet? Like one person like listens to the end and then takes transcripts out mm. of context and puts them on Twitter. Oh yeah. And, yeah, yeah. and then weaponizes we're, we're it. both. Yeah, we're both hung up in cages from you know the the the, the, the virtual church in town. Uh, and left our bodies are left to run. It's so sickening. <laughs> this whole thing is like it's a legitimate virus, mental virus, all of this stuff. And it's 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 just like you know I think it's just the ego run rampant and people with a position to exploit power um, by using technology to do so. And it's just like, it's an age old thing. As we mentioned, if you are a history buff, it's like, okay, well, they've been doing this forever. So it's like, you look at the chaos of it and whether this is what I've gotten interested in stoicism. And there's some interesting principles to it that follow logic, which I interested are interesting. And one of the, the things that is kind of the device of the system of thought is we cannot control the things, but we can control our reaction to the things. So yeah. somebody, let's say 10 years from now, somehow people as a culture have a stink about what we've said here in some capacity. This gets translated. And then all of a sudden you and I are just kind of moseying around and then, hey, you're the devil <laughs> <laughs> and everybody hates you and you're the worst. And, you're, and then we can either go, well, that's your choice to feel that way or I'm, I'm feeling this physically and I should and I am the devil, you know, and this is a choice, you know, right. the way I look at it is like, I've already dealt with trolls and stuff. So I'm just like, Oh, okay. Like I have the, the power to just be like, well, I'll just mute and block you. And then, you know, it, it yeah. could be, we are the, it could be, we are the devil. Well, yeah, probably or a bit of both. <laughs> yeah. Cause I, I bet, you know, deeply evil people, you know, they probably didn't really see themselves that way. This is the most evil person. This is, what I always come to realize is that the most evil people amongst us are the ones that are not 
willing to see that they are the one that are evil you know it's like and then you have all these constructs of belief that kind of tell people like no what you're doing is right you know mm-hmm. like uh, i don't want to use words because i'll upset people but it's belief well, systems and you know right. political and then belief the systems end justifies the means yes of course because how are you going to tell me that i need to go and kill another person without even identifying who they are and, and for this reason and and i get that and i can understand why people would be put in that situation but it's that age-old thing it's like napoleon i think remember he said to one of his lieutenants at the time of one of these gnarly battles he's just like I, i'm paraphrasing i'm totally ruining what he said but it basically was like it's it's crazy that they're willing to do this for this idea yeah <laughs> right and yeah. he was saying that atop the hill watching it happen like i just yeah, the <laughs> first person with total war. He spent like you know thirty thousand lives a month or something it's on insane. this. Insane, insane. Yeah, <laughs> but consider consider a, another story from the Napoleonic era. Um, in the early days of medicine, you know, doctors were kind of the uh, they were charlatans. They basically took rich people's money and made them feel better. Mm-hmm. The lower class were the surgeons, people that uh, you know had bone saws and and you know patch people back together so you know when when they were you know had massive amount of casualties the surgeons would take all these people into huge interior spaces with sawdust on the floor and blood soaked mattresses and do the amputations that cannonballs caused and the numbers were so huge that and then i think one surgeon had this idea or something the effect of if I wash my hands in between seeing patients, the number of deaths by infections drops. Mm. Scale. Yeah. The elephant. Scale. Yeah. Because, you know, so that innovation at that time, you know, when would that have been discovered? Mm. It really took something on the scale of mass death, but probably by setting us on the path of understanding uh, micro you know, bacteria yeah. and its role in. Uh, our bodies it could have actually saved more people than died in the napoleonic wars mm. this is why i say ai i think is going to be interesting because it's going to give us that perspective through simulations yes. basically um and it can see yes. out into the future by computation so yeah, yes which is going to be interesting it'll give us the perspective that might be able to uh help in certain ways and also not so yeah i i, I hope so uh your buddy uh Lezier, I think probably thinks otherwise. So I'm gonna have to look into what he's got to say. Uh, yeah, you know, yeah, he's will just say <laughs> Your best we're all bud. dead. <laughs> yeah. I mean he's he's kinda like uh, you know, with Chat GPT four, um, some people are are saying there is a ghost in the machine mm. at some point. And you know, he may, he makes a point of, you know, look, as soon as AI gives its appearance as a pretty girl and talks to you yeah, and cool. likes you, yeah. it's people are gone yeah yeah so, well, most people i would say i would um I've, i'm imagining you've watched like ex machina or something you've seen that film you've seen that uh which which ex machina uh, i don't want to spoil it if you haven't seen it i would just watch it but is that is that, is that, is that ghost in the shell no so ghost ghost in the shell is is no it's a uh, ex machina is a as a film uh i'll send you a link to it but it's interesting. I won't get into it because I'd rather you just watch it because I don't like to say anything about anything, before, if, especially if it'll maybe spark a, a, an intriguing idea in your mind. But okay. um, yeah, I, was, I think that that's a, probably in the form of media film is probably closer to what I think certain things will happen and how it will unwrap potentially. Um, but mm-hmm. it's, it's, it's a, that same director went off to do Annihilation, which I think is attached to the three body problem. I think that's part of that thing oh uh alex no. garland is, is that name. oh is it alec garland oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. okay yeah ex machina and yeah. that had a uh that 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 dark-haired swedish actress i can't remember her name uh yeah probably i can't remember uh she mar- married uh michael fassbinder i don't know i don't alicia follow. alicia, alicia v kander yeah that's her name yeah maybe yeah, I don't yeah. know. It's okay. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I did see that okay. when, when she does escape. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and okay. I thought that was interesting that they that um, Isaac, the main the main kind of god that created a lot of these things, he he designed it and built it. So you had this like um, Turing test that was occurring in in real time, yes. and all these things were happening. Uh-huh. 
I just thought it was interesting microcosm and it was probably one of the more relevant films of, you know, uh, that kind of captured some of these ideas of influence, which I thought was interesting, but yeah. Yeah, anyways. that's absolutely, I, I'm going to rewatch that because mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, that was done before uh, the shit storm. So it'd be interesting <laughs> to see, yeah. you know? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, it's uh, yeah. The, the, so and that's kind of how I look at it too, which I think is fascinating. So when I realized when I was using, cause I was on beta test for mid journey and diffusion, all this stuff, I, I, I was like really interested and curious because I think it's important to look at these things and face them and see them for what they are. And so I looked at it and I said, oh, okay, the thing that I haven't been able to see and still the problem is that taste and what I, taste is not there, but taste is intrinsically connected to the human experience, in my opinion, taste, in my mm-hmm. opinion, is taste is your style and your style is everything that you failed and, and gone through. And that's what mm-hmm. your taste is. And so the machine hasn't necessarily captured that as I've seen it, but it, it kind of can make a summation, but it's almost like yeah. a parlor trick for the most part, the way I looked at it. And I could be completely misunderstanding it. And that might not even be the intention of it, which is fine too. And it's not if I wasn't attached to art the way I am and, and how it feeds my family and stuff, then I would definitely have a different perspective on it. But I, because I'm so deeply saturated in it, in my reality that I look at it with this lens. But once I saw it for what it was, I was like, okay, this is a very powerful tool, very interesting and very significant to everything that we're about to face with a lot of this stuff. But what it did to me was really weird. It made me realize that I just like making art because I enjoy it. And I like to just do it because it makes me happy. And that is me just being a simple monkey with the dopamine thing. And I'm addicted to it right, like a drug. Right. And I'm okay with right. it. Yeah. I, I, I say when you're the drug and the drug dealer, life is interesting. And this is literally how I look at my art in my life. I'm like, oh, cool. Right. Yeah, this is, yeah. And, and this feels great. And, and it's literally, I'm just getting high on my art. Um, have you played with yeah. some of the training models and what's your thoughts on all this stuff? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that they're absolutely brilliant. And uh, I, 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 all right, here, here's another word game for you. Let's do it. Um, when we look back at, um, say, 1990 to 2050 in art, and we're in 2500 and i say creative genius what's going to actually come to mind uh, i think it will be the software and the hardware like I, I i would say without reservation and i truly do believe this that photoshop is a greater intellectual and creative achievement than anything that has ever been created with photoshop <laughs> that's kind of a sh- I'm That's not, kind of a shocking thing I'm for not a, thought you of know, it like that. Can you say that again? I want to process what you just said because I think it can't. It went through me too fast because what you said prior to that, I was trying to grasp it. Because you said in twenty five hundred, if we make it to that, which I don't think we will. Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> so, uh, uh, but we, if we, we make it that far, we will look back at this and say it wasn't the art and the human interaction with it, yeah. but it was the software and and hardware interwoven yes. together to create a sandbox. Is this what you're saying? Yeah, these these tools as acts of creation, mm-hmm. of insight, of seeing things in different ways. The, the the creation of these things is requiring the same type of insight that we are lauding artists for. Mm-hmm. They are beautiful acts of creation. They are creating a tool that which never existed before. Because it now does exist, it seems like it's part of the universe, like a tree. Yeah. No, true. they were created. Yeah. Somebody had the foresight and the vision to do this. And you know, to me, that's like I walk into a museum and I see a painting. I have the similar feeling as when I look at Photoshop and say, This is incredible. Mm. Yeah, so no, that's no, why no, I was no, saying, no. you know, the Photoshop is 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 a more amazing creation than anything that has come out of Photoshop. Wow. Yeah. That's a statement. And that's a statement. Yeah. It's a statement. Yeah. And it's a personal one. Um, yeah, it I don't is. know. Like I would say, I mean, I think that's a, fin- I won't, I'm going to chew on that for a bit. I don't know if I can it's, have an even it, opinion it, on that. Cause that's like, it's, it's a thing I need it's to a bit chew of a on. Troll. Well, it's, it's a, a bit beautiful of a troll thought just though. To, 
Yeah, what's well, it's, it's, it's just a troll to get people to to think about the issue because sure. actually there's no way to really. I mean, how do you quantify this? It's a ridiculous. Well, statement. it's your thought. Yeah. Well, it's your yeah. thought on so, an idea, which is it's, it's an unsupportable biased. opinion. Depending, yeah, you know, and and yeah, so it's clearly like my saying, you know, there's no such thing as as composition. It's a troll to get people to think about it. Mm. Which I I I think it's fantastic, and it also. I think, um, well, for me personally, it, what you've done too is you just you you shot a, a cannon right at the ego, and um, for a lot of people, it's going to be shattering. What do you mean that this yeah. software is more important than the art that I slaved over, and and I have all these construct values that associate that this is really what matters, when in fact none of it matters. <laughs> it's and if you look at it, uh, well, okay, again, this is all personal truth. The way I look at art. I look at art as, yeah, okay, let's use the term simple monkey on the branch. I'm having the dopamine thing. I look at art as a drug that I put produced for myself. It's masturbatory. If yeah. I'm fucking cool with that. Because if I'm uh-huh. not, then there's a big problem. That means I'm lying to yeah. myself. <laughs> and that's yeah, really and scary. Said, just trying to get past the self-serving rationalization of it and trying to see things, whether for good or ill, for you know, whether it aggrandizes yourself or diminishes themselves, you know, because so many people that they, they cannot separate principle from interest. Mm. You know, I have self-interest and I always argue from that self-interest. Well, what about principle? What the hell is that? <laughs> that is, you can know? you dig into that? That's actually, I've not, that's interesting. That's, uh, I've not thought about those things and how to separate them. And in, in that's, well, sense. just say like, you know, Donald Trump, he, he argues everything from his self-interest. Mm. The fact that, that there could be a different way of seeing things or that reality might be this way, or there might be a principle here. It's completely beside the point. Mm -hmm. And like when my five-year-old says, no, I don't want the same size of piece of cake as my brother. I want a bigger piece. (laughs) But yeah, it's like, you know, when, when there are gray areas and it's not really clear, then people tend to start arguing and, and pushing their own self interests and Mm -hmm. something that places them in a higher place in the social order or in their own mind, as opposed to something that does the opposite, all things being equal, why not do that? Mm-hmm. But some people take it to a, a real extreme and they have no associate, they have no principle whatsoever. It's all what I can negotiate. Mm. That's, okay, this is good. I'm going to chew on these because that's, I need to see those flags in my own intention through life too and be cautious of them as well because absolutely, uh, it's really dangerous to to go through life with self-interest as your driver, I think it's important to have the principles that is, right. at least it's, it's, it's difficult to be self-aware and it's also, yeah. it's hard. It's hurt. It's, it hurts to go shit. I've been doing this all wrong the whole time or shit. Like I'm harming people. You know, I don't want to harm people. That's yeah, why I said be. the true evil people are the one that are unaware of their evil. <laughs> and well, they think they're righteous. Think about, um, think about like, uh, you ever known somebody that um like they're having trouble drawing and but they have the ideas mm. and you give them a 3D program or you play and all of a sudden their genius blossoms yep. and it's just that they could not understand how perspective distorts forms into shapes mm. they don't have that coprocessor in their brain and it leads people to think like, well, that, I, you know, that looks like my dog drew that. You can't draw. You don't have any ideas. You're a crappy artist. Yeah. But yeah. you, you bypass that module and there's an amazing thing there. Yeah. yeah. So I look at AI and in a sense, it could be almost like Prometheus where you have these people out there that either they, they can't hire an illustrator, they can't hire a writer. Yeah. I saw that. Too. And and you know so but they have it imagination is, yeah. they they have stories yeah. they have vision and this is going to unlock that now of course there's going to be all kinds of what erotic furry fan fiction <laughs> um hey man yeah, don't we might on my drown porn. in that <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know somewhere in there 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 is and the thing is is like look at how copyright has been set up one you can't copyright a style so you know, trying to bring down the AI companies by saying they're stealing my style, that's not going to apply because the precedent's already there in law. And people say, well, 
Craig, you're arguing your self-interest as opposed to principle here because you're almost 60 years old and you're going to retire soon. So you don't care that AI is going to kill us all or, I mean, take away our jobs. Mm -hmm. And I'd say, okay, well, let's go back to, you know, when I was making X per painting in 2005 and I put all this artwork out there and instead of silicon copying uh, what I was doing, human beings did it and completely undercut me in the market and flooded the market. And my income fell by two thirds. Did I address this in the courts? No, I took the side of it as this is actually beautiful. Yes, I took it in the shorts, but I think collectively, this is going to be better for humanity. This is a price that I'm willing to pay for. You don't have a choice in that either. Everything better. Yeah. yeah, that's actually true too. It's like trying to say, Hey, gravity is making my boobs sag. So I'm going to redress the government to try to get out your gravity outlawed. Yeah, that's an escapist you know, mindset. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, look, you better come up with a way of looking at this in a positive way or it's right. going to destroy you. Yeah. yeah. Even with and all a the, lot of people, the, the, the sad things that we've been talking about today, it's like what I'm, what I personally look at is it's beautiful to admit that there's a, there's a plausible bad end to this and to be cautious of it. Yeah. <laughs> Then, then to turn yeah, your, yeah. Your, your cheek to it, you know? So, sorry, you're saying a lot of people? Well, yeah, I, I think, you know, individ- as I said a long time ago, you know, individually we're kind of screwed, but collectively we're <laughs> probably going to be fine. Hopefully, yeah. <laughs> Gosh, how long have we been talking? Not long uh, enough. It's two hours uh, almost. How long do you have? You want to do another uh, 10, 15 minutes? Yeah, that's good. We haven't even talked about NFTs. <laughs> We haven't. Yeah, and talk about self-interest. My goodness, you know. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, okay. Let's let's get into this a little bit too, because I think it'd be kind of interesting because of who you are and who you are in this space, uh, as we see it, or whatever that means. Um, being a person that you, as you said, uh, was luck and timing, and then intent mm-hmm. and hard work to then spark, you know, make digital art kind of this interesting thing which you just said you know people okay let's see if i'm I clear my thought here is that when you were doing this with the mouse and you were taking digital art to this level and you saw okay shoot i could instead of doing this to photos i could do it to paint and i'm using this module as you explain and i'm using this logic that i was taught at art center and then i'm mm-hmm. applying it to this thing now let's go all the way you're almost you said 69 years old and this whole thing 59. that 59 sorry i said 69 yeah i added another 10 years to you sorry no, please. <laughs> must have more time uh <laughs> yeah so at your age now and the blockchain comes up and this thing called nfts come up wh- how did you get introduced to it what how, what happened here like where where did this come at? what was your introduction and all that stuff uh Oh, hello? I'm here. Oh, my earbud just made it sound like do 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 do. Oh, but it's still working. Okay. <laughs> the earbuds are probably going to go. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, I think I woke up one morning. I I I got my bowl of Cheerios and I wandered over to my computer and I sat down and I see Beeple sells NFT for sixty nine million. <laughs> and I go, that motherfucker! <laughs> oh my god, I'm so fucking jealous. <laughs> oh. <laughs> did you did you know Mike before all this? I did. I I, I didn't know him well. We, we I I'd spoken with him. We were both working on Spider Man, Spider Verse, ah, okay. and uh, we were both remote. We were the only artists working remotely, and uh, the, the the time got changed, so we both show up, and I'm like, "Hello," and he goes, "Hello," and we just we just talk for an hour. You, you used know? Mike's so, voice against him. That's my voice too. <laughs> no, only Mike has that voice. <laughs> oh, I, I did not mean to imitate him at all. I didn't even know. Yeah, I'm sure he wouldn't care either way. <laughs> <laughs> he probably wouldn't. No, no. zero fucks. Yeah. What yeah. are you talking about? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Love him. Such a unique person. Okay, so this came up and you're like, oh, what the fuck? Because this is a couple years past you guys working together. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It is. So this is the um, first time you're hearing of what an NFT is. 
Uh, no, actually, I think I had, uh, that, well, that, I mean, that was the first time, you know, it kind of definitely got my attention, you know, grabbed me by the short and curlies, um, obviously. I like that term, um, short and curlies. But, <laughs> but uh, you know, I've been hearing, you know, friends of mine, you know, selling us you know, painting for like 30 grand. And then I think uh, Digital painting. somebody sold a collection for, for like 2 million and it sold out in, in, in 15.2 seconds. Hmm. Is this you know, digital Something work? like that. Yeah, yeah, okay. digital work. Gotcha. Okay. Um, yeah, so that's the first time I, I I heard of it, and I had, I mean, I first known about cryptocurrency and then followed that, and I think the idea of that is beautiful. Yeah, blockchain and is beautiful when you look at it like a. I still am very optimistic Same. that this will help humanity's future. Same um what is it about it that makes is, you feel that way it's transparency mm, yeah that's and the ability of anybody to interact with anybody else in the planet in a transparent way mm -hmm. and the inability to well i mean there's yeah the, the nasty people can always inter you know interdict in that um so I'm not really sure if it can be corrupted, but you know, in the early days, absolutely, it's been the wild west. Hello. Yeah, I can hear you. Oh, yeah. yeah the the other one went. Doo -doo -doo -doo. Uh -oh. These Google earbuds, they they don't really. I mean, two hours. I guess that's asking a lot for them. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, the Apple ones will so, probably go uh, like four or so. Yeah. yeah. So. Um, yeah. Um, Cryptocurrency. NFTs coming aware of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cryptocurrency is. <laughs> it it is unfortunate that a lot of crooks moved into the space yeah. immediately. Oh, I knew it was going to happen. Yeah, you could see it. Yeah, and, the and you know the height, the the height of it is Matt Damon telling me, you know, don't be a loser in a Super Bowl ad. You know, like <laughs> when I saw that, I'm just like, uh, you know. I, I, I look at it as like a diamond ring at the bottom of a pit toilet sludge, you know, <laughs> like all this has to be removed before we get to the diamond ring because, you know, just every, every form of, of creature jumped on top of that so hard. Yeah. And, you know, as, as I've said several really times, before, I guess, you know, it was really I, exposing. I, I live in a place with, with no, with no billboards. Yeah, um it. the stink of rationalization and uh, self-aggrandizement is kind of nasty and selling anything i'm allergic to yeah i saw that and so you know the, the whole point of of trying to hype this into in, into into pump and dump it was just kind of obscene um but the thing is is if I were to sell an NFT and take money from a crypto bro, <laughs> uh, and you know, it, it is, I am, I am entering into a voluntary contract with this person. And yeah, you could say that, all right, Craig, you say you don't like rationalization. Are you rationalizing now and selling an NFT? I thought a lot about that. Yeah. Contradictory. And it is. Yeah. Um, but the thing is, is I, I really don't see how it's any different than the traditional art market. It isn't. It's a, and it's it, not it's different from client work either, except for the it, aspect it, of communication. It is a game. It is, it, a is, game. it is a game that uses tokens yep. and people try to manipulate other people's version of reality to make their token worth more in the future. Isn't that client work? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's it's a lot of uh, what what people do. But yeah, so yeah. you know, I'm I, then when I you know like the first NFT that I sold, I got involved with you know with a company that you know hyped things in a way that I was extremely unhappy with. <laughs> if I if I want to sell an NFT and it's not done publicly, and an individual wants to collect it for their own reasons, and we're not attempting to sell anything, hype anything, lie to anybody. That I don't have a problem with. Sure. On your terms. On my terms. Yeah. But what was done with that first NFT, I'm I'm still just shuddering over how unpleasant that was. Mm. Okay, we won't get into that. Because yeah, I mean it's the space is just 
uh, fraught with a lot of toxicity. If anything, it was like, oh, wow, there is a lot of disgusting stuff out there and, and it's eye opening. And I knew it was there, but it's like, oh, wow, like it's really here. And, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's disgusting. (laughs) And also, uh, but at the same time, there's been some, and on my side of things, and I know you as well as I've encountered and met some really good people and, uh, yeah, the diamond ring is down there. It is there. Yeah. And there is, so the thing that will survive through this are those people, those people that have good intentions who actually think things through and have a sense of history and a core understanding of how the ebbs and flows work. They're still going to mm-hmm. be here when this thing pumps and dumps and goes all over the place. But yeah, it's a, it's a very volatile space. Yeah. yeah. It, it will not be recognizable in 10 years, probably. Mm-mm. No, no, I don't think so. If it actually becomes what it should be, uh, it won't be. And it'll be this thing like, oh, that was weird that that happened. But now look at this, you know, look at global economy mm-hmm. now. Look at how we transact energy in the form of money. Look at this. Look how transparent this is. Huh, interesting. Mm-hmm. If it does be embraced, if it is embraced the way I hope it will be, but who knows, you know, so, but I look at okay. it because I was look, I was reading some of your comments as you were discussing and you mentioned art should be valued by how much it influences people. And that was a quote that I got from your post. And I thought that was really an interesting quantifiable yeah. logic thing. Yeah. There. And, and your, your struggle with NFTs is, is very personal to me as well. Uh, I'm, I, I, if I could, I would just remain private and quiet to myself, but this isn't the world that I live in and, uh, going out there and saying, Hey, I'm valuable and buy my stuff. It goes against almost every fiber of myself, but at the same time, if you don't do that, you're You're not getting anywhere. You're not getting anywhere. (laughs) So you have to step outside yourself. Yeah. And, and I've always tried to reason with this by, by transposing NFTs to a physical painting. And let's say that I have a physical painting I wish to sell in the open market. Am I going to uh, like put reproductions of it around Times Square and say, you know, Da Vinci got nothing on me, baby. <laughs> Please do and, that. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, try, trying to pump that up. No, it's going to be a private sale to somebody that wants the painting for their own reasons, whether it be, and even if it's speculative, I don't really mind. Yeah. Um, I would prefer they like the painting, but you know, that's (laughs) also a material. Their reasons are their own. Yes. And that is out of your control. Yeah. So so you're talking about your principles merging to self-interest, self-interest, harmonizing with principles. Is this correct? Yes. Yes. Yeah, it's, so, it's tough. you know, I, 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 I kind of look at, you know, anytime I've ever dealt with the finite world, I have the same overwhelming desire to take a shower <laughs> that the same you know, reason why I want to go and take a shower, you know, after the NFT stuff yeah. is this type of selling this type of, I wish to change people's perception of reality. But then, you know, some people say, Look, there is no objective reality anyway, so why why shouldn't you try to play this game to your own interests? Yeah, if you see it as a game. And yeah. Because I don't like it when people do it to me. Mhm. Yeah. Yeah. This so the that's problem. the main reason why I don't want to to do that to other people. Yeah. Which does violate the golden rule. Well, it's your friction point with your principles, right? And so it's like, I have principles here, these yeah. are what I stand by, but then you're like, shit, my principles are getting in the way of my self-interest. <laughs> and then you well, gotta have a hard look at yourself and go, "Am I against my own principles?" <laughs> and you have that conundrum. Yeah. But then you know, if I have the chance to make sixty-nine million dollars mm. and then retire and paint everything they want, and my family are secure, mm. which is the, one of the main reasons why I exist at all. Yeah. Uh, you know, principles. how much am I willing to bend my principles? I heard a saying. You know, a quote it's, it's basically it's basically breaking bad in the art world. <laughs> Eve, yeah, it can definitely be that. Yeah. The moment that that happened, I was there uh, on this clubhouse call with a group of people that Mike had brought on to partake in this event that had happened. And none of us knew what was going to happen at that level. 
when it yeah. all happened, it was just like, what the fuck? This is a paradigm <laughs> moment. I was like fucking, I was shaking. Like I, I couldn't believe it. And then yeah. I, then I, uh, when I got a chance to talk to Mike, like later, like a couple days later. Or so I was like, do you have a therapist? Like, <laughs> cause you're going to need one, uh, because of what you're about to deal with the onslaught of, um, people coming to you and you're going to be an alien in a lot of ways, you know? So yeah, but it's like a lot of winner. Yeah. But he's, he's handled it with such interesting Mike grace that it's just like, it's really inspiring, honestly. And I think uh, a lot of it is because he knows who he is and he's got a fantastic family and they're all very tight, which is great. Yeah. And that, that's and why he's able to maintain still it. making art. Yeah. Like and his, on his, his terms. Yeah, yeah. on his terms. Yeah. On his terms, which is fucking fantastic. I heard a saying, a quote that I thought was pretty interesting last night when I was reading a book. It said, if you want to know what God thinks of money, just look at the people he gave it to. It's from Dorothy Parker. <laughs> pretty interesting one. Kind of cheeky. Oh, I, but, yeah. I love Dorothy Parker. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting mm -hmm. uh, quote though. I thought, but um, okay. Let's she had, she had another one that was uh, somebody challenged her to come up with a funny uh, sentence using the word horticulture. Hmm. And she said, mm, you can lead a whore to culture, but you can't make her think. <laughs> wow. <laughs> levels. <laughs> yeah, levels. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. I love that. Okay, let's she, wrap. She was, she was brilliant. Yeah, yeah. Tr when somebody can take something serious and turn it into comedic, uh, that is in my mind, uh, a form of creation that is on levels of brilliance. And, and I've, I yep. love that. Like, like comedians have been having a field day with all this uh, literal hysteria that's occurred in the past five, 10 years or so. I mean, it's been insane. They're just literally just shooting fish in a barrel basically, or whatever the saying is. Um, let's wrap this. I want to ask you two more questions if that's okay. Okay. And it's, it's, I, you know, my, my, my headphones may, may go out. I don't know, but if you know, they if do, can happens, you put your can... head to your phone? Yeah, I'll just, I'll just, well, uh, are you looking at me? No, there's no, this is no, audio. Yeah. There's no video. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, uh, what I'll do is, is the, I'll, I'll just do it by speaker. Okay. Well, as long like, as I don't by, hear by, myself. Right with the phone. So, yeah. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. I, well, I won't turn it on, uh, speakerphone. I'll put it up to my ear. So that, that should fix that. Fantastic. Thank you. Okay. okay. We're almost Shoot, there. Two questions. Yeah. We had. We've kind of talked about this in, on the side of things, but it's kind of been a, a, a mixture throughout the conversation. When you encounter, let's say an artist, a young person that is just about to embark on their creative path and all of this stuff is going on and you have your perspective of reality, of what you see as the path of an artist, potentially. If they came to you and asked you, what advice would you give me to better my journey, to make it more fulfilling, what would the, your answer be? Mm, save spring. What is mm. it? Oh, I mean, there, there was some Woody Allen line about that. Like, you know, the only advice his grandfather or father gave him was save spring. Save spring? <laughs> yes, the spring, you know, like string you tie packages with. I'm thinking about the question. Um, it's a big one. Yeah, it it is, and you know, I suppose Have you principles. could answer that in very large terms and very abstract terms. But of course, that decreases my responsibility for the quality of the advice. <laughs> um, I love the engineering also, aspects of this response. Yeah, I mean, you could definitely write an equation, you know, with this. <laughs> Or, you know, go extremely, it says, I think you should use general pen, general number two pencils for, for your drawing. <laughs> um, so. Go general with yeah. it, whatever, who cares? Yeah. Uh, as an artist. Um, mm, 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 mm. Okay, well, here's some, you know, uh, what is that saying? I guess it's not too far from what I try to get across them is uh, um, seek out those people that that seek the truth and you should run away from those who say that they have found it. Mm. 
So that's probably good advice in life in general Mm -hmm. and kind of gets back to what we're talking about as far as we have uh, a very limited understanding of the mechanisms of art at this point. And once you start to think you understand how it works, it's probably an illusion. And once your brain starts to turn to concrete, because you think you have these principles and you think they are true principles because they produce output. What was that? I think it was a, something from the three body problem uh, with the turkey scientist. And, uh, you know, a turkey scientist is at a farm and um, observes that uh, the farmer comes and feeds all the turkeys every single day at 11 a.m. And concludes from that that the universe is stable and predictable and uh until thanksgiving uh and then it doesn't work anymore because the farmer comes and kills them all (laughs) (laughs) i need to read this yeah you need to read yeah definitely read three body problem it's really cool Mm -hmm. i think the second one is is my favorite that's what i hear too from everybody yeah Mm -hmm. so anyway um yeah so uh, seek truth and run away from those that say they they know the truth yeah and and don't be one of those people that say that you found it because you haven't. No one has. You know, we're, 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 we're still generations away from that. It will happen. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Our understanding of it will be, and, and we will know that we understand the truth of how art works when we have completely bypassed the Emotion. upper brain. And yeah, completely bypassed that and got mm-hmm. you to buy um, a little Present. red-haired girl dolls. Yeah, frozen girl what, what, when, when you have no choice in that, we now understand exactly how art works. <laughs> uh, I love that. Yeah, it, 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 bypassing the, the lizard brain. Last question. Yeah. I, lo- I, I, think yeah. that I, I love that advice, and, I'm, I, and I personally need to be reminded of it, so thank you for that. And that's a lifetime advice, too, which is great, and it's something to live by, too, which is... Yeah, yeah, it goes beyond art. You know, yeah. It goes into a Everything. variety of things. Philosophy, yeah. religion politics, money, everything. Mm-hmm. Uh, yep. What are your top three core principles? When you're making a decision on something in life, do you know what those are? Mm. I have 10, but I have to look at them all the time. But yeah, <laughs> what are your top three? No, I, I would say that the, the same mechanism applies to having any principle like that. They become like principles of composition. Mm. That so you don't have them? I no, I, I, I do, but I can't really quantify them. I feel them. I interpret them. And I trust that I am following them because I understand the sensation of rationalization and excuse. Yeah. So I would say I, I, I don't have a principle like that for the same reason I wouldn't have a principle in making art that, you know, following those types of rules. Mm. But the thing about having a dead fast me. rule like that is it helps you because you can't trust your lizard brain to not rationalize to your own self-interest. Hundred percent. That's the problem. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I think I think my buds just went. So hang on. Okay. Hello. There we go. Awesome. It sounds there, great too. Okay. Yeah. 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 That, that's not too bad. Um, so no principles. Yeah. Or no. Well, clear I principles. mean. Can- but can you understand the connection to all the ideas we've been talking about as far as principles in art? Oh yeah, absolutely. It's yeah. Just that, so, but yeah. the thing is, is it, it really, it, it, it gets scary because now it has real consequences, yeah. not like art where, you know, um, but yeah, I mean, I kind of try to feel when something doesn't feel right, it's probably not right. When it feels right, it probably is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I, I think that, but the thing is, is that really requires a whole lot of honesty about something tickling you in the back of the brain, like this is not right. Mm-hmm. And, and not letting Moloch come in and tell you, yeah, yeah, it's okay. You can do this. <laughs> but that's the thing is when you have a principle, it offloads that responsibility onto the principle mm-hmm. and say, I don't have the responsibility for making a decision here. I simply follow this principle. Don't blame me. Mm. And oh, that's so that's one, another it. another reason why I, 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 I mean, it sounds weird. Like, yeah, I don't got any principles, man. <laughs> Come over and uh, give me your, give me your social security number. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You're doing my head in here because like I, I tend to be a person of routine because I 
scatter my mind and my thoughts easily. And having a system that helps me avoid the, the pitfalls of self-interest has helped me find certain things, but there are pitfalls to having principles, which I didn't even, that is conundrum. So thanks a lot. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks for that. Because now I'm going to be like, damn it, is this principle self-filling or what's happening here? You know? So yeah. (laughs) Yeah. It was, it just, but you know, it's it's a simplification that it can actually make life. But you know, the thing is, is we have simple models of all kinds of things that make life possible. Mm -hmm. And even, even things that are convenient fictions that allow us to live because we don't know. Yeah. Even though we know it's wrong, but it works right now. Mm. I'm reading this book called Breathe right now. Have you heard of Breathe, the book? No. It's it, uh, This will be the last thing, I promise. But it's basically, uh, I'm only about a quarter of the way through. I have it on my Kindle. That's why I know it's a quarter way through. But, um, so I can't give it a full analysis. But what I've gathered so far is it's really been influential on my approach to understanding what's happening with my breath. Uh, it's a thing that we've kind of, forgotten how to do apparently from this book and mouth breathing is a big problem and he doesn't just talk about this in case of like uh opinions it's that he's chasing science with it so there's logic and things attached to it scientists and basically discovering like what happens to you if you use your mouth to breathe primarily and the difference between that and your nose and um but anyways back to an earlier statement you had men made about people that don't want to change that like want to go back to the hobbit land there are Mm -hmm. certain things that we have lost big important things that i feel we've lost through the the evolution and Mm -hmm. and this book is actually one of those red flags where i was like shit breathing where if if, apparently to this book we're doing it wrong and this is a weird thing a conundrum to think about a thing that we do uh without even thinking about we're doing it potentially wrong and we're doing it against what our best interests are, which is to maintain a, a stasis of existence. And a lot of health issues have come from lack of breathing properly, which is really interesting. Literally the only reason I got into this is my friend recommended it to me, but I'm also really into intense cycling stuff. So like breathing is such an important part of my success with being faster. So it's been this yeah. like weird fascination that I've fully fallen into and so I tape my mouth shut when I sleep at night, and that's been interesting. I'm on day three. Oh, <laughs> yeah. oh my God, taping your mouth shut at night? Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, so you use your nose only. Yeah. <laughs> Do you wake up with, like, uh, very dry nasal passages? No, it's, you would think so. It's, it's it like, so I was really apprehensive of it, and I was like, yeah, yeah, whatever. And then I said, you know what, let me just try this out and see what happens. And um, usually through the night I would get thirsty and drink water or I need to drink water. But what was happening is my mouth is open. So my, my mouth was drying out that way. And then you also get worse breath from this as well, because all the bacteria is feeding on the oxygen and so on and so forth. But it bypasses that mostly as I understand it, when it goes through your nose and then your body tr- processes the oxygen differently through your nose, your nose, your nose is actually, um, uh, moistening the air. Uh, making it, uh, cleaning it through basically so that when it gets into your, uh, your system, it can be processed more efficiently and better. It's really interesting. So anyways, it's a book that I'd recommend checking out. It's called, uh, breathe, breathe the, uh, the, the, the new, the new science of a lost art. That's what it's called. I'll send it. On interesting. To yeah. But well, you know, I, 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 have problems with bloody knuckles from dragging him on the ground you know <laughs> try breathing try try breathing right that might help a knuckle dragging mouth breather <laughs> yeah it's a it's a fin- it, I, the first time i heard it and this was like an old thing people were saying like yeah you breathe through your mouth you're ugly or something i heard some sort of weird thing and i was like what who says that and then i looked into it i was like whoa interesting like it makes your face gaunt and there's all these weird things that happen that it basically you're suffocating yourself this is weird. I'd say just read it because I'm ruining it by not uh, actually explaining really what this book is about because I haven't finished it yet. But so far, it's been really interesting to to look into. So um, again, I will this, check it out. Again, this is we're always a consummate student to life, and this is the way I approach it. And there's never a dull moment if you're willing to be curious of everything. Craig, I really appreciate you taking the time and being so candid and open. And this has been a fantastic. Uh, two and a half hours of my life. So I thank you so much. (laughs) Thank you. I enjoyed myself greatly.
Yeah. And I, I hope that nobody listens to it for my sake, <laughs> but I, I hope well, they, they listen to it for your sake. No. You can just cut out all the parts where I'm talking. <laughs> okay. <laughs> deal. Deal. Yeah. That's in my all right, thanks. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks man. a lot, Arsh. Ash. <laughs> Arsh is <laughs> even <Bye>. better. <laughs> Arsh. <laughs> what was that? <laughs> thanks, Craig. Hey, I'll Have talk to you day. later. Yeah. Hey, bye. bye.